plan. And the, all the projects that are up there, Martis uh, Camp, Hopkins Ranch, Lahontan, the Timlick Project, the Forest Hill Divide Community Plan, the Placer Vineyard Specific Plan, Regional University Specific Plan, Bickford Ranch Specific Plan, Riolo Vineyard Specific Plan, Bayside Church, North Star Village and the North Star Highlands, the village at Squaw Valley, Tykert Aggregate Mine, the Biomass Project up at Tahoe, the Homewood Mountain Resort Project, which was just considered by this commission, and the FERC Relicensing Project. Uh, Scott has and continues to have direct involvement in each of these projects, and the success of each of these projects is a result of Scott's caring and thoughtful uh, input into the planning process. When you look at what is the role of an attorney, there are many opinions as to what an attorney should or shouldn't be. But the, but the real role of an attorney is to be a guidance counselor, to provide direction. Uh, in the public sector, it's even more challenging. Uh, through my career, I've had, dealt with many attorneys who want to provide policy direction. In, in his years with the county, Scott has never crossed that line. Scott is very careful to identify how a project can or can't be defended, what are the weaknesses, and then the ultimate decision on how to proceed is left up to staff. And when you look at the wide variety of projects that Scott has been involved with, Scott has left an indelible imprint on this county in a very positive way that will be experienced for years to come. And so on behalf of the Community Development Resource Agency and the county, I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate Scott on his 15 years of uh, hard work here with the county and to wish him all the best in his retirement. Scott, congratulations. Well, from the commission point of view, uh, we want to second all that. You know, Scott's been a very a good advisor for the commission. And uh, I've seen him in a lot of my time here on the county, working actually in the FERC project in here. And, uh, you know, I second everything he said. I uh, want to offer Scott uh, congratulations. Boy, we're going to miss you. We're kind of a surprise for us today, so we, you know, we're just kind of reacting to it now. But uh, with the real heartfelt <coughs> thank you from the commission. Well, thank you. I um, actually would have asked Karen to be here today if I'd have known Michael was going to do this, so I could have... Uh, <laughs> Uh, um, a little embarrassed by uh, all his kind words, but uh, I do want to uh, also express my appreciation um, to Michael and to all of the planning staff, uh, because through all those years and all those projects, it wasn't just council, it was truly a team effort. And uh, if it hadn't been for the hard work of all the planning staff, we attorneys wouldn't have had anything to do. And of course, then uh, the commission always, and then the board of supervisors has to make the hard decisions at the end of the day. Um, I do want to say, though, that uh, um, I have worked in several jurisdictions. Uh, I've worked in several states throughout my career. And uh, um, I think one of the things that uh, people may not appreciate as much as they should is that Placer County is a very special place. And I think uh, the opportunity to work here, particularly work on these kind of interesting projects um, with the diversity of experience that uh, I've been able to participate in here has been truly rewarding. And uh, I don't want to call it the capstone of my career because although I am, quote, retiring from the county, I'm not, quote, retiring from life. Um, as, as many of you know, there are second and third careers out there. Um, uh, I am looking forward to being able to stand at that podium and, and uh, say what I really think on some of these projects. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave that for another day. Uh, uh, but uh, um, it has been a very rewarding experience. Um, you've got a lot of good people working for the county here. Um, it's been very interesting. I know we've all been through ups and downs. There's been some very interesting times in some of these projects. Uh, there's been some very good times. And uh, I'm fully uh, uh, convinced that uh, um, regardless of, of the future, that there will continue to be interesting times. And, uh, you know, that's that old Chinese proverb. You can take it as you will. Uh, may you live in interesting times, and uh, I'm sure we will continue to do so. So uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, staff. Uh, thank you, Commission, for your kind words. Yeah, good luck. Thank you. Okay, well, you have lunch time yet? <laughs>
Okay, well, Commission, I guess we might as well uh, move on here. We're a little bit surprised and uh, appreciative of, of the work that's been done. Let me see. Uh, hmm? Here, I thought we were going to have a big meeting today. <laughs> okay, well, our, our first project on the uh, agenda is dealing with a proposed uh, uh, general plan amendment and subdivision map uh, and some condominium, condominium construction up on the Donner Summit area. And for that, we have Jerry Haas who's going to make the presentation to us. As soon as he finds his notes. I can just uh, manually point. But it's oh. not going to change the slides. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, Commissioners. The project for your consideration today is uh, the Sierra Sun Villas. It's, thank you, Michael. A proposed condominium complex on the north side of Donner Pass Road, uh, directly across the street from Sugar Bowl uh, parking lot and gondola facility. In keeping with this season, you have a veritable sleigh load of entitlements to request here. The entitlements include a general plan amendment and rezone to align the underlying land use designation with the site zoning and uh, to add a planned residential unit or planned residential uh, development designation to the site as well. A conditional use permit to facilitate the planned residential development, tentative subdivision map uh, to convert three existing parcels into the eight lot subdivision. And finally, adoption of a mitigated negative declaration, which addresses the potential environmental impacts associated with the project. At the conclusion of this presentation, staff will request your action on the conditional use permit, the planned residential development, the tentative subdivision, subdivision map, and the adoption of the mitigated negative declaration. Uh, in addition, staff will request your recommendation to the Board of Supervisors for the proposed general plan amendment and rezone. This is a map of the project site and vicinity. Uh, Interstate 80 is some two and a half miles to the west over there, and Sugar Bowl Resort is directly to the south. This is an aerial image of the site, which consists of three contiguous parcels here. Uh, they total about 9.24 acres when you add in the right of way out here uh, along Donner Pass Road. The site's characterized by steep slopes. Uh, to the north, there is a cut bank along Donner Pass Road over here, and then there's an open paved parking area that's used by Sugar Bowl at this point. The proposal at this time is limited to a 12-unit, three-story condominium uh, complex. The project name CR Sun Villas is derived from the design of the units to take advantage of the south-facing slope, and uh, uh, that would be for the use of passive solar heating and lighting for the units. The requested 10.2 unit units per acre PD designation would yield the potential for up to 36 units, uh, total units on the site, while maintaining the minimum required set aside for open space on the lots. Uh, however, any proposed additional, entitle, uh, additional units beyond the 12 being considered this time would require a new entitlement request and, and a second environmental determination. As discussed in the staff report, the GPA, the General Plan Amendment, will remove an inconsistency between the existing site zoning of resort and, and the agricultural timberland land use designation. And this inconsistency likely stems from an interpretation of the original 1967 general plan, which was a little vague uh, when it was updated uh, in 1994. This is an exhibit that demonstrates the zoning and the underlying land use designation. Uh, you can see that the whole central area here is all zoned resort that the underlying land use designation, this agriculture timberland, extends throughout the entire site except for this little pocket of high density residential there. This is a diagram of how the site zoning and land use designations will be modified if approved. I'm sorry, it's a little unclear, but essentially the existing zoning resort and proposed zoning would be resort with a PD designation. So that doesn't change too much, just allows for a consolidation of the development site uh, in exchange for a set aside of open space. The current general plan designation is agriculture timberland, 80 acre minimum. Uh, these lots are only two and a half acres in size, something like that. So the requested proposed general plan 
designation would be tourist resort uh, commercial. This is the site plan as it's proposed. Uh, lots one and two are right here, and they would consist of uh, only of the common lots, or excuse me, only of the residential structures. This is where the condominium units would be located. Lots A right here, B, which you can't see too clearly, it's one of these two lots up here, and C are all common lots for the shared driveway, parking lot, and snow storage. Lots three and four, this one up here, and this one down here, are set aside for future development. Again, that's subject to a subsequent entitlement request, applications, and approvals. And lot D, finally, is the set aside for open space. And it is sufficient in size to accommodate the envisioned build out of the site while maintaining the minimum 35% open space requirement. As mentioned in the staff report, the county has received two comment letters from Sugar Bowl Corporation during the course of this review. Staff has worked with the applicant to address Sugar Bowl's concerns related to parking, drainage, aesthetics, and snow removal. Staff has determined that through a revision of the site plan that's reflected here, and with the adoption of the mitigation measures, these impacts are all reduced to less than significant levels. As you've gathered from the uh, findings attached to the staff report, staff is in support of all requested entitlements uh, subject to the attached conditions of approval. Staff also recommends adoption of the mitigated negative declaration for the project. And finally, staff requests your recommendation to the Board of Supervisors for approval of the requested general plan amendment and rezone. And I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Any questions? I just have, have one question. I noticed in the staff report and in some of the backup, there was this issue with the power lines. Mm -hmm. is that, has that been addressed? Did you mention that? Or, or Yes, that was addressed. I'm, gonna, whoops, I'm not going to go back two spaces here. Power lines run along the south side of the road here. To get power to this site, there is a power pole that runs, I think it's somewhere in the middle. And uh, the concerns from Sugar Bowl was by relocating this power pole over here, I think it was going to go further to the west originally, um, it would create some aesthetic concerns for them. Um, so the applicant has revised the site plan and they actually moved the power pole to the east property line. Uh, it's further out of the way. Anybody coming into the parking lot for Sugar Bowl down here wouldn't see the poles crossing the road there. Okay. Or if they did, it would be off in the distance. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, the air quality, we're asked to include a standard note regarding building plans and, and the disallowance of wood burning or pellet appliances and the, and the only natural gas or propane. Is natural gas available up there? Don't know if natural gas is available. That's a standard wording for a condition. This would likely be propane. Uh, if it's approved up there. Um, so I, I don't believe natural gas is available. It's, it would be propane. <laughs> Jerry, I, can you give me a quick rundown on the parking issues up there? I was okay with it until I got the second Sugar Bowl letter, <laughs> and now I'm confused. What's, what's the problem that they're uh, trying to mitigate? The concern... Uh, expressed by Sugar Bowl is that this lot down here, it's lot four, but it's also identified on um, Sugar Bowl's original conditional use permit, excuse me, not their original, but their, when Sugar Bowl expanded and constructed the Judah Lodge, uh, they were, uh, their parking was uh, developed, there was a parking plan that was developed for them that included um, a series of off-site parking spaces. One of them was this lot up here that I believe was then owned by Sugar Bowl. Uh, also, the parking lot to the south of the site on uh, south of Donner Pass Road, and then some right of way parking. Uh, this proposal will remove approximately 39 parking spaces uh, from the use of this lot through the construction of this driveway right here. Uh, staff's determination uh, is that that loss can be made up for partially by restoration of full year round parking in the right of way, but really the bigger issue is that. Uh, Sugar Bowl and the applicant have uh, reached an understanding that these parking spaces up here would represent what we call destination uh, skiers. These are not day skiers that come up and would park in the lot, but they're still skiers who would likely use ski resort as their recreational amenity when they come up here. Uh, in fact, the, these, uh, the condominiums overlook, the view that they have overlooks Sugar Bowl. Uh, it's envisioned that people who would purchase these units, would be skiers or snowboarders. They would be up there frequently throughout the year so that the use of those parking spaces is offset 
by, uh, by the fact that they're simply patrons of the site or patrons of, uh, of Sugar Bowl. So they were concerned that the elimination of those spots would somehow adversely affect their CUP? That's correct. And did you say that this previously was Sugar Bowl's property? Uh, right, that's correct. Okay, so they sell them the property and then complain about the use. I got uh, it. Okay. okay. <laughs> There's uh, an underlying lease agreement, I understand, between the property owner uh, who, who has agreed to continually provide parking okay. to Sugar Bowl on the site. Yeah, I was just uh, focused on their letter that was in the Okay. Uh, one thing before we go any further, uh, there's one minor modification to a condition that I, I neglected to mention earlier. Uh, it is very minor. Uh, it's condition number 14F, uh, which states that fire hydrants shall be spaced no more than 500 feet apart. The, the conclusion of that condition states that the location of the fire hydrant shall be approved by Placer County Fire Department. This is actually um, in Truckee Fire Fire, uh, fire district, so uh, that, that wording should be changed to Truckee Fire Department instead of uh, Placer County. Okay, any other questions? Just one. Okay. Uh, I think in the report it mentions uh, consideration. Um, you uh, from Sugar Bowl, um, and Sugar Bowl seems to think that that was, their view was not uh, adversely affected. Uh, no, the, the aesthetics concern was related to the power pole, not so much the view of the, of the hillside the up above them. Uh, you know, actually, uh, as stated in the staff report, if you're in Sugar Bowl, and I go up there a couple times a year myself, uh, if you're down there uh, skiing, snowboarding, and you look up the hill, you see the gondola. The, the, these units being constructed on the hill up above the gondola would actually be screened partially by the gondola facility itself. So you wouldn't see them from Sugar Bowl so much? You, you wouldn't see. You would see them, but it wouldn't be a glaring. It wouldn't be this mm -hmm. very Was prominent there consideration feature. given to the view from uh, Van Norden Meadow? Pardon? Was any consideration given to the view that you would be seeing these buildings from Van Norden Meadow, which is the primary uh, environmental uh, uh, concerned uh, area up there? Right. Um, yeah, we did consider that, and it had sort of the same impacts that because the, the gondola feature was high enough that it would kind of screen downhill views, down slope views, I guess you'd call it. It wasn't a significant impact. We've also addressed uh, the lighting issues out there as well to make sure that you don't have. Uh, glaring light. Um, I think we have a couple conditions that address the lighting specific to the project. Okay. One more question. Yeah, okay. This, and I have one too. Okay. So go ahead. The go sales ahead. trailer. Um, I understand that that's got to go as soon as we're turning dirt somewhere. Right. The condition is worded. Um, so typically, you'll have a sales trailer that is there and, and is used as a construction trailer until the first unit is built. In this case, because there are impacts to the, the parking lot here uh, with the site as it's proposed and through the improvement stage, uh, the addition of a sales trailer and the parking associated with that is going to be an additional impact on the parking that staff didn't feel uh, would be um, acceptable to Sugar Bowl. So what we've required is that, or uh, the way the condition is worded, the Sugar Bowl, uh, the applicant can install a sales trailer on the site. It can remain on site to, to, um, to facilitate um, uh, looking for uh, investors in the, in, in the property. And upon initial construction of the site, the sales trailer gets removed so that no additional impacts to parking would occur. Uh, we did allow some flexibility in that language that was brought up by Martin today, um, stating that, uh, that I think it's Condition 7, following part of Condition 7, allows for an extension of time for the trailer to remain on the site uh, as long as an agreement is reached between Sugar Bowl and the applicant. Um, let me go back to this. So the Sugar Bowl and the applicant will be determining whether the trailer stays, not us? Uh, DRC would ultimately have the final say in it. So it would come to the county. If they did come to an agreement as to how long the trailer could remain on the site, they would present it to the Development Review Committee, and we would determine whether or not it was appropriate. Okay. And if they didn't? And if we didn't? No, if they, <clears throat> if they couldn't come to an agreement. It, then it goes away in the specified time. Which is? Uh, upon construction of the improvements. So on, on the final or the beginning of the uh, beginning of construction of the improvements. I, I mean, my personal, that's when you want the sales trailer up there most. I mean, that's when the activity, that's when people are going to make inquiries. That's the most ideal time to be up there trying to market your property is when construction's going. Right. Um, if, if, if the sales trailer was able to be located entirely on the site and off of this lot, we would agree with that. And off of which lot? 
off, off of, of, the off of this lot, lot here. Delicious. It's anticipated that the sales trailer, if they decide to, to, to install one here, would be located on the property down here, which would impact some of the parking further. That's what our concern was. Okay, okay I have one, yes. a, a question too. Uh, <laughs> See, I noted that we have a fairly steep site here, mm -hmm. and a lot of discussion, of, <clears throat> excuse me, of existing erosion and those types of things, which kind of raises a little bit of concern, but I also noticed that in the conditions, there's a condition that says that uh, if uh, the development has to go beyond what the grading plan is, that uh, it has to come back to the planning commission, I guess, before it proceeds. And so that was a little bit confusing to me, but also in the staff report, the map in there was real difficult to see, and I was having trouble seeing what the grading plan really was. I see this morning we do have a copy of it, and it is, it is a pretty detailed grading plan that's available. But maybe go into some of the details on what the grading plan is. I, like I noticed, the access road uh, seems to be right on top of a real steep contour area, probably an existing cut bank, and mm -hmm. so there's going to be some pretty major work there. And then where they build the pads for the... Uh, Buildings will be some pretty major work, a lot of cut and fill, and maybe I don't know if there's going to transport uh, material off site or what's going to happen there. So maybe get a little detail on t what the grading plan really is. Okay, uh, I'll give you what I know about it, which is pretty limited, and then I'll hand it on over to Rebecca if you have further questions. Uh, there will be two retaining walls. Uh, one is going to be down uh, at the top, top of the slope below this, um, uh, the roadway here, and there'll be a second one that comes up over in this area. Uh, it is pretty steep, which is why this uh, driveway alignment was necessary. I think we get it at or below 10% slope coming up onto the property here, rounds around, and then it's kind of more level up to the top over here. This hillside here has been the one that's been in question. Uh, I don't have an image of it here, but it, it is eroding significantly down onto the roadway. Uh, it does actually decrease the amount of parking and right-of-way width that exists along the project frontage here. So. This project, constructing the retaining wall, will stabilize the slope and will uh, add additional width to the roadway out there, making it a little bit safer condition. Uh, regarding export, import, I'm not sure exactly how much is proposed out there. Uh, maybe Rebecca can answer that one. Okay. Sure. This is uh, Rebecca Tabor, Engineering and Surveying. Um, and Jerry's correct that the, the road was lengthened and um, the driveway access was placed where it was in order to meet that maximum grade of 10%, um, which was required by the county and the, the servicing fire district. Um, and the amount of, uh, the estimated amount of cut is 14,300 cubic yards, uh, 9,000 cubic yards of fill, so approximately 3,300 cubic yards of excess cut material would be exported from the site to an approved location. Okay. Um, there was another question. I think Jerry answered it, actually, about the retaining walls. Um, is there anything else on that? Well, yeah, it, with all the cut and fill, there's going to need to be quite a bit of stabilization of slopes, it would seem, and that type of thing, and we maybe have a little information on that. Right. There's um, a geotech report. Of course, we have our, our mitigation measure regarding the um, structural and stabilization of the slopes. Um, retaining wall design will be analyzed with the improvement plans. And there's there are some difficult conditions out here. Um, there, the geotech report would address recommendations such as gravel under drains, um, elevated building pads, trench drains, vertical water barriers, um, and other methods to intercept shallow groundwater. So there, there will be potentially some unique features um, incorporated in order to convey um, and capture seepage and, and um, install the roadway paving so that um, it isn't undermined. Um, let's see what else. Slope stability, rock slope protection will be placed along the steeper slopes. Um, there's a couple places where there's a one-to-one -one slope proposed, and a soils report will have to verify that, um, that the rock slope protection will be stabilized and will prevent erosion. Okay, and these are all detailed in the grading plan, apparently. 
Um, I do have a copy of the grading plan if you don't. Well, we have a copy of them after we got. To, I think this is it this morning. That's correct. You'll have two, you have two maps. One's a tentative subdivision map, and the other one's the grading, yeah. post grading and drainage. Yeah, there was one in the package, but it was real difficult to read because it was real small. So. Right. I think this helps it quite a bit, I guess. Probably more questions. Uh, is it, uh, it says a soil, uh, there's been some soil studies. Is, is this decomposed granite country, or is it? Some of the hillside uh, over here looks to be decomposed granite. I guess Rebecca knows that for sure. And that's probably where the existing erosion is. Yeah. Occurring. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I guess oh. probably if you hit granite rock, there'll be uh, quite a bit of blasting in the process too. Yeah, this project has some challenges in terms of its construction. I did recall the other the other question you had was about that condition about if other grading is to take place beyond what has been approved right. with the project, and I, I placed that condition because what you're looking at that's the the limit of grading activity that we're approving with the project. Uh -huh. um, if when the applicant is, is going out there and, and mobilizes contractors to do grading. If, my concern was that there wasn't further grading happening up the hill to maybe prepare for future development. That, that isn't approved at this time. So that's what that condition is saying. Only the grading you see on the grading plan is approved with the project. If they were to ask us to um, allow them to do some grading up on the very top of the hill for some future site development, they need to stop and come in and have the DRC review that. Okay, so this That's is what that future, condition means, right? Future site. I was, I was thinking right. that, you know, once they run into a problem and it has to come back to the Planning Commission, then, you know, we may not be looking at many options at that point. But right. if it's future, I can understand that pretty it's, clearly. And it's for the DRC to, to review any grading beyond what you see there on the grading plan that we're looking okay. at today. Okay, thank you. That clears it up for me. I have a question. Yeah, just a, um, a, the uh, existing parking lot elevation. How much lower uh, is that than the uh, say first floor of the uh, condo units? Uh, th this how lot much down rises here. There from the existing parking lot to the first level of the uh, condo. Um, I'm not sure exactly what that grade difference is. Uh, it's it's pretty significant. <laughs> It looks so from me, the existing I, road parking lot area, from the, the bottom existing of these road goes start up 20, 30, 50, 100 feet. Uh, I think it's probably closer to about 40 feet. I don't know if it's any idea. From from the existing paved, from the roadway out here up to the, the floor elevation, first floor elevation. Um, elevation I know changes. It goes up to as, as steep as 70 percent, right? Kind of look into the engineer for the project as well here. I can't recall exactly offhand uh, what the difference is. I just know the length of the road is generally 10% for raising grade. Right. The cost is it should be able to tell that it's going to spoil the down to the bottom of the It looks about. About, yeah, about 60, 62 or so, right? From the road, I'm looking at the building to the west. Um, so about 60 feet in elevation difference. So we're, we're, right. So basically we're saying that the top of those buildings are 100 feet high from the road and from the view of the road, from the road. Uh, three stories, yeah, just short of 100 feet. Right. Yeah, my concern was simply that if that view was considered from the ground level when you're looking from Sugar Bowl or if it was 100 feet higher than what you're seeing from the gondola parking lot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like I said, it, it would be visible. Um, it's not a pristine view. I mean, you do have infrastructure there. You've got power poles, the gondola, the parking lot that's there below it. So anywhere down the hill you're looking up, you're going to see some improvement of some type. This mm -hmm. facility, this unit would be behind it. Um, it would be taller, but it wouldn't be uh, uh, otherwise constructed on a pristine view, I don't think. Any more questions? Okay, thank you. Okay.
Okay, would the uh, folks that are proposing the project, would you like to make a presentation at this time? Good morning, Commissioners. I'm Martin Wood with SCO Planning and Engineering. I'm here with uh, Brian McAllister from our office and the owners, Valen and Linda Brost. And I, I'll keep this brief. I think uh, staff's presentation was, was uh, good and complete. A um, couple of issues that got brought up, maybe I can add a little bit of additional detail. The existing overhead power line, I think, is a 12 kV line that crossed the property through kind of the two buildings uh, on the west side there. And that basically feeds boreal. That kind of heads over the hill and that's what serves uh, the power needs for the, the boreal site. Um, just additionally, a couple things I wanted to add, how we came up with the design that we did. Uh, the owner you know, looked at several different scenarios as well as us uh, on how to provide access to the site. It's bounded to the east by uh, Forest Service property, and uh, we met with the Supervisor Montgomery and the Forest Service, as well as uh, submitted an application by the owner a couple years back and try to determine how they could maybe uh, get access to the east. It's a little bit easier to get access to the east. There's kind of an old Jeep trail that, that heads up to the site. However, uh, that was unsuccessful. That wasn't gonna happen. So really, we looked at this as an opportunity that the frontage of the site with the serious erosion uh, that was occurring there, by running the access the way that we did, we have an opportunity to fix that problem. And it should look, when completed, very similar to the project that Placer County recently completed to the east. Um, I think there was a grant that Placer County uh, received, and that's about a quarter mile uh, east of this project where they did a slope stabilization project. Um, again, the road grade that we came to, you know, many meetings with the fire department, how to best serve the access to the project. Uh, originally, we wanted to go 12%. Fire department basically said 10% maximum. So we had many iterations of how we came to this design. Essentially the walls that you alluded to of how that is designed. We are going with a dry stack rock look because we want a natural stone look. Uh, we try to keep the walls generally at about a 10 foot maximum height and then utilized uh, one to one slopes that are rock slope protected with uh, uh, fabric underneath. Um, it is a unique site and it has incredible views uh, at the top. Um, and we think uh, we did a, a really good way of providing access to it that will be safe as well as uh, fix the erosion problem along the frontage in the current Placer County right away. So I'm here to answer any questions along with the owner and uh, Brian from our office and I look forward to your consideration of the project. Okay. Any quick questions for anybody? In the... Okay. Well, we, we'll give you another chance if, yeah, if uh, there's more questions that need to be answered. <clears throat> Okay, at this time, uh, is there anybody from the general public that would like to make a comment on this project? Okay, step forward, sir. Go ahead and give us your name. Morning, Chris Parker with Sugar Bowl Corporation. Um, generally, uh, our reaction to the project is very positive. We, we like the project. In 2007, Linda and Valen approached us to purchase the two properties that incorporate our parking lot with the uh, idea that they would uh, develop the property to create destination beds. De destination beds for Donner Summit is very good. It's very good for the ski industry. It's a site that we're not terribly interested in developing. We've got other lands that uh, little by little we develop stuff that ski in, ski out, and uh, it's a tough site. So <laughs> we'll let uh, Val and Linda take a crack at it. Um, we did uh, in agree in the sales agreement with the bros that uh, we would uh, further uh, restrict the property uh, with a deed restriction that protected the proper, uh, the, the parking capacity. So that's really what gets down to the issue of whether or not we have issues with the, the project is that we have an agreement that we would protect the, the parking. And we looked at it from the sales agreement from a very simple standpoint, which is it's a large parking lot, has about 200 spaces, and uh, if they were to build something that would preclude us parking in that existing parking lot, that we would accept destination spaces as acceptable alternative to day skier spaces. We think it's a good, it's a good trade-off. It has good arrival departure patterns. We've always used that argument in our, our development proposals that uh, destination skiers have less peak loading of the roadway network, and it's it's just a better and more favorable uh, situation. The um, second letter that I sent to Jerry really related to something other than that, and what that was 
is the area where the retaining wall is. We currently enjoy, and through a conditional use permit with Placer County, the ability to use that parking area along the street there, about 40 spaces. And you've heard a lot about erosion. The, the uh, geomorphic uh, composition of that whole hillside is breccia, <clears throat> which is volcanic mud flow. It's very unstable. Um, there's uh, bits of boulders stuck in that breccia, and every once in a while in the springtime when things get wet, it likes to calve off little rocks that go down and hit, hit cars. So when we need the parking, which is in the winter, when things are frozen and when the slope is stable because of the stable, because Breccia, by the way, has um, a very small window of opportunity when you add water to it. Uh, so you can get great compaction out of it. But when you add a little bit too much water, the R value goes to heck and it all just kind of goes, goes, uh, goes to heck. So when we don't need parking, as much parking, we don't have peak parking needs, we have boulders falling on the road on, the, on those spaces. When we do need parking, when it's frozen, when the, and the moisture stabilization of that material is correct, we do have parking. So for us, it's about peak parking. So what I, what I was concerned with in the staff's report was that uh, a favorable mitigation for losing those 39 spaces in the proper parking lot was gonna be offset by the restoration of new spaces along the road, I just felt was incorrect. We, we currently enjoy those spaces. We use them when we have peak parking demands, and uh, we just didn't want to lose those, and we wanted to make sure that the record showed that the actual replacement parking would be acceptable on the site where the destination spaces are, that we continue to expect to enjoy the on-street parking, and we very much appreciate the fact that there'll be slope stabilization now with the new retaining wall that provides for that on-street parking. So I think it's win-win now. I think that uh, Mr. Haas has done a very good job in addressing my concerns and has written the language appropriately to take care of that, that issue. Um, one thing that I don't think was mentioned in the presentation was that as a, as a and this is, gets back to that concern, is that a part of this project is the abandonment of this county of the right-of-way in that area in order for the proponent to build that retaining wall. And so here we have an agreement with the county to allow us an encroachment permit to park there but at the same time, the county, as part of this project, is abandoning that right-of-way in favor of the new retaining wall and the improvements related to this. And so you can see where we're concerned. Hey, we've been parking cars out here since you know, Caltrans was able to keep Old 40 open in the wintertime, and now you're abandoning that right-of-way where we're parking cars currently for this improvement. But I, there is a, a commitment by staff and by the proponent to uh, allow us to continue to have on-street parking there. Uh, there's enough space between uh, the traveled right of way and the toe of that new retaining wall. So we're, we're satisfied as long as that's the final outcome and that, that engineering and surveying when approving the improvement plans uh, respect that, you know, that condition as well. But rewritten very well, I appreciate it, and uh, we're, we're happy to see that the bros have a good project and we wish them success. Any questions? Go ahead. Yeah. Why couldn't it be set up so that uh, that trailer could be left there during the summer months for a longer period of time so, and removed in the winter so you didn't lose the parking and the... And yeah, I'm sure it would. I mean, I, think, I don't think our, so much a concern would be <clears throat> parking. Um, you know, there might be a space or two or something like that. It'd be more about snow removal, mm -hmm. you know, calling the bros and say, sorry, we, you're you crushed or something like that um, in your propane tank uh, for your heat is buried, buried and leaking. Um, so it's really about kind of the, the concern about winter operation. Now, whether or not that could be in our gondola parking lot or allow them to use our old abandoned ticket windows that we don't use anymore and they can put some money into freshening up, there's all kinds of ideas. And I don't think this is really an issue for us to... Well, I wasn't thinking so much of you, but I know staff has said they didn't want it there you know, after the construction started, and that yeah. seemed like that was going to be the beginning of the best sales period for them to sell whatever they had to market, and maybe at least during the summer months they could continue to be allowed to have it there but remove it for the winter. I think anything that allows the project to economically move along and get sales completed Bingo, yeah. is good. It's good for us, good for them, so uh, we can work something out. I think perhaps staff is trying to get at, hey, you've got drive them up the driveway, get them to park up there, and, and then have your preview center up top. But um, you got to drive them up there to begin with. Thank you. 
And, and I, I think I heard where staff was willing to defer if you were willing to make an agreement between the parties. That's what I heard. You know, when we had the sales agreement to purchase the property, we did um, in that agreement promise to uh, to record an easement for the use of the parking so that it actually ran with the land. So in case anything happened or sell the property, that the agreement we had in the sales would run with the land and be a, so that's the agreement we're working on right now. Uh, we were going to kind of keep that very simple just to the just to the two provisions of the sales agreement, which was revision back to Sugar Bowl if they weren't able to develop and um, and the parking. But um, we could also throw in there if, you know, sales trailer or something else that need be. But I'm working with Linda. And, uh, well, I Alex think that's what I was alerting to. I heard staff say that if the two parties are working together, then there could be an extension without a problem. Yeah. Yeah. And absolutely we're working together. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure for the record that we weren't losing those on-street parking spaces. So it seems like we're good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just a question, one more oh. question, just yeah. just for, for my own edification here. Uh, how many parking spaces do you have total approximately? And I just want to see what this 39, what percentage that is. Uh, we have probably, I'd say we have a 11 to 1,200 at Judah. And here we have about 700, so it's somewhere under 2,000 total. Okay. Um, but you know, we pay employees not to park anywhere near Sugar Bowl. We give them cash as they get off our shuttle buses. Right, we right. give them incentives. Every car to us on a peak day is every 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 spot is important. Every yeah, say. every spot has a return. I think the our business solutions people could tell you the exact amount of money it's worth. Okay, thank on a you. daily basis. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Chris, uh, excuse me, Mr. Park, one last question. Since you have the, do you have the pointer there? I believe so. Could you just point out where the east end of the existing parking is? Um, this is this driveway right here is next to Jimmy Shule's old house here, mm -hmm. and that's the one that goes underneath to our uh, snow removal underneath the garage. So actually, the gondola. No, 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 the parking other side of the street. The other side of the street? Where, I'm sorry? The other side of the street where the parking is. Oh. From the gondola. Um, I think it runs edge of pavement somewhere right down in here. And then the entrance to the gondola of parking is in this area right across the street. So it's, it's um, think about roughly 200 spaces across the street. Mm -hmm. And uh, 39 is a good percentage. It was just a little hard for me to see on the map, but I thought. Yeah, you know, I'd say it's probably right, right in here is where that edge is. Okay, thank you. Okay, do we have anybody else? Okay, seeing none step forward, I'll bring it back to the commission for deliberation. So what, what do you think, commissioners? Well, it appears, it appears from the staff's uh, recommendations and analysis and also the, the applicant, it seems like the project's uh, covered, if not all the bases, most of them. So I'm satisfied with the with the project and wish them well on, on that kind of a slope. <laughs> okay, is uh, any more comments or a motion coming forward? Well, no, I had only one comment to make that indeed it's, it's gonna be tough and, you, and they know it. Um, my only concern uh, as far as perhaps the community uh, outlook is that the uh, actual buildings are gonna be pretty high uh, on that cliff side at the top and and the view is not from Sugar Bowl primarily but from Van Norden Meadow But there's nobody living in Van Norden Meadow now, so it you know has less of a an impact, but They I think they've dotted and crossed everything that they can and so I, I would I would You know vote to approve it. Uh, it's just that uh, I wish them a lot of luck Are you making a motion here? No, go ahead, huh? go ahead. No, go ahead. You want to make it? Mr. Chairman Of the mitigated negative declaration and the five items that are part of it. I'm going to go separately on these items. Is that okay? You're going to do it separately? Just, I'm just going to do the mitigated negative deck to start with, and then we'll go on to the general plan and the others because they have different places they go. Okay, is, that, uh, is there a second? I'll second that. <clears throat> okay, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Okay, go on. I'll further move that we recommend to the Board of Supervisors that there be a general plan amendment 
as outlined in the agenda on page seven. Second. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, I'll move that we do the rezoning as outlined in this agenda, uh, which essentially just adds the unit count to the existing zoning, and that we recommend that that also go to the Board of Supervisors for their approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, I'll further recommend that we approve the conditional use permit as outlined in the agenda with all the conditions and uh, the findings that are listed in the agenda on page seven. Just as a clarification, uh, that would be with the modification of the one condition that Mr. Haas suggested. The fire district. Fire district. Oh, the fire district thing. Yes. Yeah, it was 14F. Changed Lasser to Truckee. Okay. Yes. Okay, just check in here. You're including the conditional use permit and the findings. Mm -hmm. Are you going to include the tentative map too? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so those would be recommendations D, E, and F in our staff report. Right. Okay. As modified by condition 14. Okay. Yeah. And okay. Jeffrey, you second to that? Yes. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Enjoy your project. A lot of work ahead. Thank appeal, you. Appeal period, Mr. Chairman. Oh, I, I got to state that there's an appeal period of uh, 10 calendar days. Anybody can file appeal at the office here. It will cost $520, and that is for the items that were clearly under the Planning Commission's jurisdiction, the rezoning, and uh, items are going to go to the Board of Supervisors anyway. Okay, thank you, folks. Thank you. you want these maps back? Any of them? Good luck. Here's another one if you want it. Okay, well, we'll uh, take a quick break. check our, yeah. want to take a quick break? We'll take five. Okay. Aloha. Give uh, Roy a chance to get set up there.
Correct. It's the easement or the center, center line. Center, center line. Center line. Center. That, one, that was the exempt yeah. side. And that one's 35. Okay. And these and are both pre-existing. They, they both got I, I, variance with this. Yeah. Uh, after the, the parcel map was approved before, 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 yeah. before the road was. Uh, yeah. Was now, with this, this is one, uh, one, one two, two, three, four. four. Right. Now, is that one, two, three? Okay, three? we'll go ahead and get started again. Okay. This item is a uh, appeal of the zoning administrator's decision down the Granite Bay Community Plan area, and we have Roy Schaefer who is going to make the initial presentation on this from the Planning Department. Thank you, Chairman. The appellant, on behalf of Artisan California, is appealing the zoning administrator's decision to deny the variance request to reduce the front setback requirement on three undeveloped lots, and they're lots one, two, and four in what is known as the Granite Bay Meadows subdivision, which was, um, this part of it was created with a minor land division and a parcel map, and the applicant is requesting approval of a variance to allow a 50-foot front setback from the center line of the traveled way of the access road, where typically a 75-foot setback is required. And it is these, uh, it only highlights uh, lot two, but this is lot one next to Sierra College, and then this is lot two. And lot three had, uh, has an existing single family residence on it, and then this is lot four. And what they call Granite Bay Meadows is actually two different minor land divisions and two different parcel maps, and these four lots to the south were created with a different minor land division and parcel map. And before this was approved, it was just a driveway that went down on two different uh, properties and an existing house on either one. And so there's just a driveway serving the two houses that existed there. And so the total of the four lots is known as the Granite Bay Meadows. And um, let's see here. Now what we put in the staff report for the Planning Commission is that this whole area, this is all the unincorporated area of the county, and this is the, these are the four lots here, is uh, a fairly large island that is surrounded by the city of Roseville to the north, east, and west. And then below uh, this area here is all Sac County, Sacramento County, uh, which is below the uh, unincorporated parts in here. And there is a subdivision across here, and I think it, I believe this is uh, Wood Bridge in this area. And then this is the parcel map that was created, and the zoning is a 40,000 square foot minimum, which the parcels meet uh, that zoning requirement. And then part of the, um, the access road takes 20 feet off of this parcel map that we're dealing with here, and then the, parcel, the Wu parcel map that was created on the south side is also adding uh, taking off 20 feet of the lot size, you could say. <clears throat> now, since the uh, denial, the appellant has, an applicant has revised the project to increase the side setbacks for each of the subject lots to compensate for the proposed reduction in the front yard setback. And as stated by the appellant, the increase in the side yard setbacks will maintain the rural character of the project site while allowing for front yard setback reduction that is consistent with existing residences in the um, immediate neighborhood. And I just go back to the, uh, this slide here. Now when the uh, minor land division was approved, there was an existing house, large residence, and I think you just got a photograph of that this morning from the appellant's attorney. And the existing residence was approved for a 37-foot uh, setback from the center line of that road, 
as part of the uh, condition of approval before the parcel map was recorded. And we typically say in planning that a variance does not set a precedent for any other property. But in this case, one of the problems the appellant has pointed out, this house is approved at 37 feet from the center line because it existed. And then on the other side of the road, too, there's an existing residence with the same kind of front setback. And so you have lot one, lot two, and lot four that by the zoning ordinance, a typical front setback is 75 feet from the center line. So in effect, you would have a, a house being constructed on lot one and two that sits much farther back if they didn't get a variance, and then also on lot four. So that is part of the argument uh, presented by the appellant and in this staff report on page 16, we've included if the Planning Commission chooses uh, to make this decision, we've included um, facts for supporting new information for supporting the variance request and then also as well when you continue on we have um, included findings for parcel one, two, and four if the Planning Commission, um, based on the Planning Commission decision, if they want to approve the request. And I'd be open to any questions if there are any. I see a lot of study and any questions? Yes. Or is that a standard for the county in any it, subdivision? It is re, uh, directly related to this, this zone district that's uh, the 40,000 square foot minimum parcel size. Plus the thing you do with uh, when your access road is less than 50 feet, you add 25 feet. So that's how you come out with the 75. So it would normally be a 50 foot, but because of the length of it. Yes, if you had a if you had a um, a 50 foot wide access road, then it would be 50 feet from the edge of easement, typically quoted that way. In this case, you add 25 feet because the access road is 20 taken off of each of these parcel maps, so it's a total of 40 feet. So you quote 75 feet from the center line. Because I, I've i looked at it and I, I wish that there was a picture from the front gate entry just looking down where it showed the existing homes. Because then you can get more of a feel. Even sometimes with the overhead, it's a little hard that uh, um, Marcus had passed out to us. But it gives you a, a sense of depth. Because when I went by there looking at the length of the driveway, there was a car sitting in the driveway and you could have parked another car behind it. Yes. Tandem parked and, and there was more than enough room for vehicles to get in and out. I think the photograph that was um, presented this morning does show maybe a little bit, uh, some of that clarity too, with <coughs> those the two existing homes. And I've, I've heard from the public, I heard from uh, Mrs. Wu, who's uh, on the parcel map on the other side. She uh, supported the uh, request. And then I heard this morning from uh, Sandy Harris, who had some concerns about when you have an original owner that goes through the parcel map process and they agree to it and know what it's all about, and then you get a new owner, then there could be um, a different opinion, I guess. That's what she was concerned about. That's great. Okay, anything else for Roy? Roy, the, the, the actual pavement width is still standard, correct? Um, and changing the setback, we're not going to affect anything like the ability to park on street or anything like no. that? No. Okay. And that's a private uh, private access road, so I'm not sure if there's any postings or signs or what they've done with it. Uh, 
you know, I think there would be adequate uh, parking if there needed to be beside on the street. Yeah, just for I mean, most of us. Thank you. It is gated. Okay, is that it for Roy? Yes. Okay, thank you, Roy. Let me see. Uh, we have an applicant and an appellant. Are they both the same? And both, uh, the same. both represented by the same person. Okay. So now we'll give the applicant and the appellant uh, a chance. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission, Marcus LaDuca, LaDuca and Avdis, 3200 Douglas Boulevard in Roseville, on behalf of both the applicant and appellant. Um, as you heard from the staff and seen from the pictures, you have a very unique situation in front of you. You have this island of the county um, that's surrounded by the city, and then right past the uh, south is property of Sacramento County. So it's a, a, a fairly unique set of circumstances, compounded by the fact that you have two existing homes, part of two separate parcel maps and one subdivision, both of which were granted uh, uh, variances. Um, but there's an additional uh, unique aspect of this that uh, hasn't been presented. And that is typically in Granite Bay, um, uh, when you have one acre lots, uh, and I've represented a number of projects with those, they're typically the 140, 145 feet wide, 300 feet deep. Um, get you to your roughly one acre in size. Um, standard lot uh, for one acre so you can have a fairly large home and have quite a bit of uh, uh, room in the backyard for a large backyard. These are wide and shallow um, one acre lots. So we're looking at depths of about 180 to 190 feet. Um, and that is the component here that is unique in terms of concern over precedent and other projects that might come in. You just don't see these uh, on one acre lots. So what we're looking at uh, in our request, uh, as staff mentioned, the two other existing homes received setback variances, one 37, one is 35 uh, feet. We're not asking for that. We're not saying we should have the exact same as those uh, two existing homes. Uh, we're asking for 50 feet from center line, so as opposed to a 50% reduction, about a third reduction in the uh, front yard setback. That will still allow us to enjoy the same privileges as those two lots. Uh, which is to have a backyard that's more than 30 to 40 feet deep because without the setback variance, um, you have a, a home, fairly large home, and then you're going to have a fairly small, uh, back, relatively small backyard area uh, for that. So that's what the, really the looking at that request. And you only have to go across Sierra College Boulevard in a Woodbridge Ranch. They have some one-acre lots there, and they're the standard, um, the 140, 145, 300 feet deep, large, large backyards. The other thing about the homes here is um, the homes that are existing there, it's hard to see from the photos, they're not really oriented to the street. In some way they are, in some way they aren't. Um, and they're rather deep homes. Um, the homes that will be built on the three lots in question are going to be oriented to the st street, and they're going to be wider homes. So they're not going to be, it's not like we're asking for, you know, designing excessively deep homes, and that's what's creating the issue. The issue is the fact of setting back 75 feet. Um, the one aspect that staff did mention is if you were to deny the variances, say go out and build those homes at a uh, 75-foot setback, you in essence create a sawtooth pattern on the north side of the, of, the, of the street, is that you have one home very close, homes on either side of it set back, and you have this, in terms of visually from the street, um, this anomaly. Um, the variances uh, address that. Um, one of the aspects of the community plan um, is to avoid the, in, uh, the rural setting um, is the idea of avoiding crowding. And so since the zoning administrator hearing, uh, we agreed to side yard setbacks on the three lots that with the setback with lot number three, the existing home, will create rather large distances in between homes. Uh, to give you an idea on lot number one, which is the one closest to Sierra College Boulevard, the western setback is 100 feet uh, to try to get as far away from Sierra College Boulevard and um, noise from that. It has an eastern setback of 20 feet, which is the, the county standard. But lot two right next to it, its western setback is 75 feet. So there will be 95 feet in between home, those two homes. And then lot two has an eastern setback of 55 feet. When you add the rather large setback on lot number three, there's a distance, I think it's over 100 feet. Um, and then lot number four, which is different than the exhibit you have in your staff report, will now have 35 feet on either side. And if you look at the uh, distance on 
Um, lot number three, the home, and it's set back on its eastern property line, it's 35 feet, so the minimum will be 70 feet. So the idea was to create larger areas so you don't create a issue over, um, you know, a crowding issue that the community plan talks about trying to avoid in a, in a rural setting. Um, so with that, um, we're asking uh, to have the same privileges um, that uh, other one-acre lots have in terms of having a backyard uh, that is, again, more than 30 to 40 feet, but uh, allows the ability to uh, enjoy the same privileges as the two existing lots, again, in two separate parcel maps uh, in the subdivision. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, the Commission might have, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Marcus. Um, maybe explain, it, it is a gated community. Yes. And so the roads are all internal, so they're not, they're not connecting to any other roads. That's so correct. No, there's no exterior traffic that's circulating. That's correct. Just strictly for those lots. That's that correct. There. And to give you an idea, if I can, Mr. Chairman, the picture might be easier to show on this side. Um, it may be so the subdivision is these eight lots. This area below the black line on your picture, that's a separate property, and that will not be connected. Um, this is just that road, that entry road is simply for the eight lots the four on the north side, and the four on the south side. A question for Marcus, Mr. Lugaduka. Yes. Uh, you, the side yard setback, in this zoning, it would normally be 20 feet? That's correct. So normally you would have 40 feet between two, two adjacent right. houses. Right, so we're looking at 70 to 100 and some odd feet in between homes. Okay, thank you. And we'll still have, again, using the wide and shallow, trying to work within the context of that, have wider homes as opposed to narrow homes and having a big home to the back like the existing home has. It looks like it goes quite a ways back. Ours will look, uh, again, have a wider footprint from the streetscape but still have that wide distance of between homes so that we're not using even more of that backyard area. The idea is to design around the fact that these are wide and shallow lots. You can't just come in and say, give us a variance because we want to design the same type of home, but it's it will be a, uh, a wider home, not as deep, but we still want to have the opportunity to have a wider backyard than 30 to 40 feet. Okay, any more questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Marcus, what's the side, the side setback that you're proposing again? Um, on lot number one, which is the one closest to Sierra College, the western setback is 100 feet. Mm -hmm. The eastern setback is 20. Okay, what, where I'm getting hung up is I'm looking through the staff report and we have some conditions, and I, I know you've read this, mm -hmm. conditions for granting the variance and some conditions of approval, and I don't see that in there anywhere. Wouldn't it make sense that that would be included as part of that package, those numbers? We'd be more than happy to have those listed, and it may have been that these, were, these came out before the, the appeal had been filed, but in terms of some of the, the detail, some of the numbers may not have... Uh, work their way into conditions. Well, also, you're, you're requesting a 50-foot front setback, right? That's correct. Yeah, and yet item 5 in the condition of approval says 20 feet. So I'm getting confused between what I'm reading. Because the con um, one second, one's from edge of pavement, the other's from center street. Yeah, so we're talking apples and oranges here, and uh, to quote my big fat Greek wedding, either way you the, have Yeah, the first, the, the conditions for approval, the first one says 50 feet, and then it says... In no case, case of the face of grass closer to 20 feet from edge of pavement. Because remember, these are pri it's a private road, so yep. the road is included in the front yard setback. So that's consistent with the 50 foot? Correct. Okay, what about the side setback? Uh, the side setback should, uh, should probably be added as a, as a condition. Because that's the one thing since the ZA hearing, that there was movement of some, some of the way to make some of those wider as opposed to just going 20. Because I think it just showed an envelope on a couple of them that just was at, tw at 20 on one side. I don't disagree with the concept. What happens is we talk about this right. and then we get out in the field and somehow it doesn't get into the report and it gets dropped. Understood. Yeah, so I, I'm Roy, I'm sure, madly scribbling over there trying to answer my question. And Mr. Chairman, we can work on a condition to, on the side setbacks. We'll just need the, uh, Marcus, uh, it sounded like for lot one you want Lot one, it will be 100 feet to the west. <clears throat> Got it. 20 feet to the east. Got it. Lot two will be 75 feet to the west. 75. And 55 feet to the east. 55? Yes. And lot number four will be 35 feet on each side. Got it. So 
So what we'll do, uh, Mr. Chairman, is we'll add an additional condition that will say the side setbacks for the subject lot shall be as follows, and just as Marcus uh, said, for lot one, two, and four, those numbers that we just okay. indicated. Thank you. Thank you for that catch, Mr. President. So we will add that condition. Okay. Any more questions? Um, question for Roy again, if I could. Condition six. The How about that? Oh, yeah, no. Huh? Okay. Okay, we're good for now. Okay, thank, thank you, Marcus. You. Anybody from uh, the audience that wants to speak on this project? Okay, now I'll bring it back to the commission. And Jeff, go ahead. Question for you now, Roy. We, we have this variance expiring in December of 2013? Uh, typically, it's a two-year um, time frame. Uh, and I guess I just got to ask the simple question, why? If, if the logic is good to do this between now and 2013, why would it be any different in 2014 or 15? Uh, maybe if I could answer. Uh, the ordinance requires, uh, allows for approval of variance for two years. And uh, basically what the applicant will need to do is um, uh, obtain a building permit and start construction of, of the building. Once they start construction of the building, put in a foundation, that exercises the variance so it's, it's vested at that point. If, for example, they weren't able to um, pull a building permit and start construction within that two-year time frame, there is opportunities to come back for extensions of time to that variance. Okay, uh, commissioners, anything else? Any more questions? If not, then no, uh, discussion? I, I just have a question, I mean a comment. I, first of all, um, I want to compliment staff, uh, planning staff, on their original determination on this because I think they're trying to follow the ordinances, you know, to the letter and, and trying to give the reasons why it should, have, should be denied. So, um, and actually I came up here today driving up willing to back up the, the, the administ zoning administrator on it. Uh, but, you know, I did look at the property this morning. I went out before the commission, and uh, I think with these side yard setbacks and, and also the, the idea, this is a gated community. I mean, it's got four lots. It's a dead-end road, basically. Uh, it's not, there's no traffic on the road, um, and it's still going to keep the rural character the way that it's being designed, yeah. so I'm, I'm in favor of the alternate uh, position. Okay. Okay, well, if you have no other discussion, I would make a motion. Before I do that, Paul, the comments or the limitations on the side setbacks, where would they be included? And not necessarily in the findings for the variances, but in the re revised uh, conditions of approval? That's correct. We would add an, an additional condition of approval um, that you would be a, uh, adopting. And just as a clarification um, relating to the side setbacks, uh, for lot two, uh, I was just informed by the applicants uh, that there is a little pop out on one of the houses and so instead of 75 feet on the west side setback for lot two, it would be 72 feet. So that would be one adjustment to that. So as it, we are proposing a new condition that adds that, those side setback requirements. Be condition number seven then? Um, I guess. Yeah, it'll be condition seven. Okay, well, if that's the case, then I move that the uh, Planning Commission adopt the findings for approval of variance for parcels 1, 2, and 4, which are three separate documents in our staff report, including the CEQA findings and the variance findings for each parcel and the conditions of approval that are attached in the, attach in the uh, staff report as modified here to include the limitations on the side setback as condition number seven. I'll second. Okay, uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I guess uh, this is appealable too, isn't it? Yes. And so, uh, of course, so yeah, we have 10 calendar days. Appeal fee is uh, $520. Okay, we have uh, Roy Schaefer again, <clears throat> and he's going to uh, 
present uh, another variance to us than a proposal on what we might uh, act on with regards to this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, staff is requesting that the Planning Commission continue this item to an open date in order to provide staff time to further analyze and take appropriate action relating to the information filed with the appeal. And uh, we have today Mr. and Mrs. McCall are here, the applicants here, and Marilyn Jasper uh, from the appellant is here. And um, I know from talking previously to before the hearing with Marilyn Jasper, she had some uh, additional hard copies of documents to submit today, and I got an email from her this morning. And um, this is part of the reason why we are asking for the continuance. We've had uh, 40, 50 pages come in, including uh, an attorney firm from San Francisco that's representing uh, on behalf of the applicant, uh, appellant, sorry. Okay, thank you, Roy. Maybe before we uh, take action on your recommendation, we'll see if the applicant would like to uh, say anything. You're welcome to do so now. First of all, I want to thank you for your time uh, considering the matter, and Roy, who we've worked with, that um, I actually came unprepared to talk today, figuring that this was going to be a continuance, and apparently it, it looks like we may need a little bit more help as far as representation. But clearly the, what we're trying to do, um, unknowingly at the first, and we try to do the right thing by getting permits to, to replace an existing uh, shed structure that we had on our property that um, I'm guessing at the age is at least 20 years old. It's dilapidated, it's falling apart, it is basically of no use. We went to replace it. Uh, we got approval from the Homeowners Association. Um, they excitedly approved it. Um, knowing not what steps to take next, we decided that well, let's do everything by the book. We came and uh, got permits. And basically, I guess that's when the hornet's nest was open here. Um, we had no idea what any of this was going to be going on. Um, we do want to apply by all county rules and uh, regulations. Um, we basically just wanted to replace what we had already from, um, I'm assuming, at least three to four homeowners before us. This was not disclosed to us in any shape or form that this, there was any problem or variances or anything of that nature and we were trying to do the right thing by building this, which would be a lot more appealing than what we have now. Um, so that's basically where we're standing, and like I said, we're suddenly have found ourselves against a, a, a tidal wave of opposition, and all we wanted to do was just improve our home. Okay, well thank you. It sounds like, I, what's the commission, oh, go ahead. Well, I, I know we're, we're not gonna take action and, and we shouldn't be discussing, but I just have a question. Um, is, is, the, is the new shed gonna be at the same distance from the property line? That it causes the problem because we, the shed that we ordered uh, ended up being as far as the engineer that designed it for us. Uh -huh was a few feet wider than the original, which encroaches upon uh, the, the variances. Okay, thank you. To answer that, it's also um, existing at 75 feet from the center line of Miner's Ravine, which is behind the property, and the request is to have it that same distance from the center line of Miner's Ravine. Yeah. Okay, uh, the appellant? Thank you. Good morning. My name is Marilyn Jasper, the appellant, and I'm speaking on behalf of Public Interest Coalition and the Sierra Club. Um, we are sympathetic for any citizens having to go through hassles, but um, currently we have a number of Public Record uh, Act requests in progress, which may or may not be relevant to this at all. But recently we did receive some documents 
from the county. One is a notice, uh, this is October 2006, a uh, notice of possible uh, code violation on this parcel. And then in February of 2007, the follow-up uh, notice of code violation cons concerning this 100-foot creek encroach setback encroachment. So we'd like to submit these and hope that they will be considered by staff and eventually by you along with the other um, documents and information that we've submitted. Okay, thank you. Give it to you. Okay, well, I'll bring this back to uh, the commission at this time to act on uh, Roy's request. Well, I would move that we continue this matter to an uh, unspecified date. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, we're a little bit early for our one o'clock session, so unless I'm reading this. You're correct. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like a room's a little empty. <laughs> so I guess we're taking a break for an hour and a half, huh? That's correct. I feel like a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> What, what back?
Okay, well, I'll go ahead and call this afternoon's session of the Planning Commission to order. And so this afternoon's, this afternoon's agenda involves the uh, Granite Bay Community Plan. And so uh, we have uh, EJ Evaldi going to make a presentation on it. This is uh, a, a hearing, but uh, not a decision meeting, so we'll be finding out about it. Is that right, EJ? That is correct. So wait to see if uh, we can get the slide up. Go ahead. They said they'd rescue me if nothing came up, so I have full confidence somewhere. Daniel, 14, 13. It's televised live down in Granite Bay. We have to wait for the. <laughs> I think they'll come. Just warming up. I need to warm up. It gives me some time too. So, how was your lunch? <laughs> Good. Did you get that out? <laughs> well, we'll get. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, <laughs> There's a, the, the slides basically are just to follow along uh, in case I go a little too quick and then, uh, and then as we get to some of the more detailed stuff, uh, hopefully it will be up and we can show you some slides. So I'm E.J. Valdi. I'm with the Planning Division. Division. I'm here with Chris Smith, who is, is, is also a big part of this plan update, as well as in the audience we have several staff members uh, from various departments. And uh, there we go. And what this is, this is a workshop on the Granite Bay Community Plan update, which we'll try to get caught up to that. Does all look familiar? There we go. All right, now I have no excuses. So this, this process started back in August of 2008 uh, when the Board of Supervisors with adoption of the 2008-2009 budget directed staff to review the planning, goals, policies, and land use regulations in the 1989 community plan to determine if they remain valid as the plan was approaching almost 20 years old. The Grant Bay Community Plan, as you know, provides a framework and a vision for the long-term growth and orderly Development of Granite Bay plan was originally adopted in 1989 and since that time has undergone minor revisions including an update to the circulation element in 2005. Over the last three years uh, there have been dozens of community meetings, uh, MAC meetings and MAC subcommittee meetings uh, and hundreds of Granite Bay residents and community members have participated in this process. So on our agenda today, uh, at today's workshop, I want to highlight some of the changes that have occurred in the Granite Bay area since the plan's 1989 adoption. Chris uh, will provide an overview of changes that have uh, been included in the draft of the updated community plan. And then I will inform you of the next steps in the planning process and next opportunities for the community to continue to participate in the plan update. Up on the slide, you'll see a kind of schedule of where we've been in the last three years. Supervisor Euler made the first public announcement of the Granite Bay Community Plan update at the November 5th, 2008 Granite Bay MAC meeting. The actual work started in January of 2009. This was when all landowners who own property within the Granite Bay Community Plan area boundary uh, were notified about the plan update. There were approximately 8,500 parcels uh, and those property owners were notified. 
At the same time, we opened up a six-month window for residents and community members to submit policy and land use change requests. In February of 2009, we held the first community meeting at the Lutheran Church where we had over 400 people in attendance. Uh, at that meeting, county staff provided an overview of the community plan uh, review process and informed everyone about the six-month time frame to submit policy change and land use change requests. By the June 30th deadline, uh, the planning department had received 284 policy change requests and 49 land use change request forms. In October of 2009, we held a second community meeting at the Lutheran Church. Uh, this was more of a workshop where we had over 300 people participate in a community survey exercise where input was provided on the community requested policy and land use changes. And then over the next nine months, there was a lot of discussion uh, regarding the proposed land use changes, both before the Granite Bay MAC uh, and also individual meetings with the private landowners. However, uh, during the plan update presented to the Board of Supervisors in August of 2010, the Board made the decision to move forward with a policy update only and without any further consideration for land use changes. The most critical period in the update process occurred in the fall of last year uh, when a special Granite Bay MAC subcommittee was formed to meet, the, uh, meet with county staff to review and make changes to the plan. It was Supervisor Euler's desire that the subcommittee be opened up to anyone in the community who was interested. Uh, the net result was a core group of 23 uh, people that included residents, community members, and also two MAC members, and those names are listed up on the slide. Uh, the subcommittee began meeting in December last year, first meeting monthly, then every two weeks, for a total of 17 meetings, uh, with the final meeting occurring in October. The subcommittee members, uh, some of which are here today in the audience, have been very devoted to this process. Uh, they've put in countless hours of their time uh, at evening meetings, sometimes running three and four hours long. Uh, this group also spent many hours of their own time on homework assignments uh, from county staff, reviewing draft goals and policies in the plan. County staff has really appreciated all of their input. Uh, we listened closely to their concerns. Uh, I can say this process has not always been easy or free of controversy, uh, but these meetings were very productive in the end. The Granite Bay MAC also played a critical role in this planning process, allowing us to use their monthly meetings as a platform to keep everybody informed. Uh, we had a workshop uh, similar to what we're doing today. We had that in November down at the Granite Bay MAC. And then uh, last night, uh, the Granite Bay MAC uh, actually took action to uh, recommend approval of this plan. Uh, and that recommendation is forward to you, the commission, and also uh, to the Board of Supervisors. So before I turn it over to Chris to talk about changes to the plan, uh, I want to share some facts about Granite Bay and what has occurred over the last 25 years. First off, uh, about half the people that reside in Granite Bay today, they were not here 25 years ago. Uh, the population in the Granite Bay area in 1996 was about 10,700 people, uh, and with the new 2010 census that's out, uh, there are now uh, almost 21,000 people. The population figures also translate into the number of housing units. Uh, in 1986, I think I have that slide there. Uh, in 1986, there were approximately uh, 3,700 residential units, and uh, during the life of the 1989 community plan, this number has climbed to over 7,500 residential units, which is about a increase in 104 percent. So build out, I kind of skipped ahead uh, on the slide, but uh, the 1989 community plan set the build out population at 29,000, which uh, most of you are familiar with, uh, based on development trends and the fact that much of the plan area developed at a less than permitted density. Uh, the population of Granite Bay will never reach that level unless changes are made to the land use diagram. In fact, uh, using a capacity analysis uh, based on the community plan's current zoning, the plan area would reach a maximum population of 24,521 people. What we have seen is that there was significant growth during the life of the existing community plan, uh, and now it seems to be winding down to the point where we expect much slower growth uh, as the Granite Bay area reaches its build-out. 
What is also interesting, uh, but may, may not be of any surprise to you folks, uh, is that many of the characteristics that attracted people to Granite Bay in the past 25 years uh, pretty much remain the same today. And up there uh, is, is a list of uh, uh, the different elements, the rural lifestyle, uh, availability of large lots, high quality schools, proximity to Folsom Lake, uh, the area's natural scenic quality, uh, the good housing stock, uh, proximity to employment centers and limited commercial development. So that kind of concludes my overview. Uh, right now we'll, we'll have Chris come up and uh, talk about the changes that were made to the plan. Uh, and then when he gets finished, I'll be back up uh, just to tell you where we go from here in the process. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Christopher Schmidt with the Planning Department. Uh, the community plan, uh, when we started this process, we sent out the, um, uh, a survey to residents and solicit, to solicit feedback on the community priorities and uh, surveyed them, polled them basically uh, on the existing goals and policies and assumptions to, uh, to see if they were still relevant and update them in the, the, the new plan. So what we heard loud and clear was the number one priority was to protect and preserve the rural character of Granite Bay. And the others, conserve natural and cultural resources, uh, strengthen the, the design guidelines for the community, uh, strongly heard that they didn't want any land use change requests uh, as part of the update. Uh, and, uh, revitalizing aging commercial sites, which we'll talk about later, and also to continue the 300 foot residential setback on the south side of Douglas that exists. So the community plan that exists today in draft form consists of 10 different chapters. Each chapter has their own goals and policies and many of the chapters have standards and implementation programs. And we'll go through those chapters in a bit. Key plan assumptions, they kind of lay the foundation for the, uh, the document, uh, it's assumed and expected the growth will continue, but it'll be much slower than um, has happened in the recent past as the community uh, approaches build out. The build out estimate in the old plan was 29,000, EJ alluded to this. The new estimate is gonna be 26,000 in the plan and it's expected that it would be, we're hard pressed to even get to that level without any um, uh, zoning changes because parcels are not being developed at their maximum uh, density allowed by zoning. Uh, the circulation land use diagram uh, will, did not change. We were directed that that would not change by the board. And sewer conveyance capacity limitations may be a constraint on future development. So those are your key assumptions that uh, filtered throughout the document. Uh, in the introduction, uh, the subcommittee and staff spent a lot of time revising the assumptions, goals, and policies, probably our first four or five meetings we're just grinding through those and, and, and making changes to reflect the conditions in the, in the community today. Uh, population housing chapter was updated based on the new 2010 census data. Uh, a new population projection was, uh, was made based on today's population and also looking at the vacant parcels that exist in the community and, and what they could be ultimately uh, developed. In the land use chapter, we added a discussion about opportunity areas and what that is, is a future work program, um, if we're given direction, which would create incentives or a new, um, a new zoning for commercial sites, which would encourage a mix of uses on some of these aging sites for housing, residential, commercial, or community uh, uses. Um, the, the land use chapter talks about adding additional density receptor parcels. And that's the program that is encouraging that preservation on the south side of Douglas Boulevard where uh, a, you can transfer the, the development potential off those lots so that they preserve this open space. And the old land use map showed where those units could be transferred to. This one says we'll consider reasonable uh, parcels. So we're kind of opening up for developers to approach us saying, I would like to do that density receptor or density transfer program, and here's the parcel I uh, would like to do that on. 
the community design chapter uh, in the old document, community design was talked about in three or four chapters. We consolidated that for not only for staff's benefit, but also the public. We strengthened the architecture site design sections. Uh, we added new design guidelines for subdivision gates, which we'll talk about later. And a new section on infill construction teardown of existing homes. And like the opportunity area program, this would be a future effort that if um, the community feels that the homes being torn down and the replacement homes are out of character with a, an older neighborhood and it becomes an issue, that we would look at uh, appropriate measures to try to rein it in uh, if and when it becomes a problem. And that was put in there because as Granite Bay reaches build out, you're not gonna have a lot of subdivisions, but what we may be seeing is people wanting the Granite Bay address, buying an older home, tearing it down, and building their big mansion, for lack of a better term, in an older neighborhood, which really is out of character to neighboring homes. So it's, it's something to watch in the future as Granite Bay uh, ages. Chapter five, the natural resources chapter, was uh, split up. We went from 36 to 15 goals created two new chapters, an open space chapter and a cultural resources chapter, added an air quality section to get in compliance with uh, state regulations, uh, health and safety chapter, uh, revised the noise section to match uh, county's the county's current standards, uh, added new discussion on the flood hazards. Uh, circulation chapter was largely untouched. We did add a complete streets, uh, a goal and related policies uh, state law says now that when new roads are put in or substantially upgraded, that the streets must accommodate all users of a road. So it's pedestrians, bicyclists, handicapped, elderly children, etc. Uh, revise the subdivision gaining policies, which we're most likely going to talk about in a little bit here. Uh, it was our most contentious issue, uh, subdivision policies. Uh, we have the language you see in the document is a compromise that the subcommittee supported, and the MAC signed off on last night. And in the circulation chapter, we consolidated the bikeways and trails section, which was, I believe it was originally in the recreation section. Uh, recreation chapter was updated to, it basically talks about all the recreational facilities that have been uh, built since the, the old plan. The parks has done a wonderful job of creating new parks out in Granite Bay. Chapter 11, Public Services, a new discussion of water conservation efforts with uh, the water districts in the county are implementing, and that those uh, deal with the new laws and regulations the state has passed. Uh, other tidbits, uh, maps, the maps, there's three uh, main maps in the document, land use, zoning, and trails. The other maps have all been put in, in the back. And uh, the max Douglas Quarter design guidelines have been added as an appendix. So we're down from, I think, five or six uh, appendices in the old document to just one in the new document. So the document is it's much more easier to use. Uh, the two MAC workshops, um, issues raised, I think you've all received in your agenda packet, are written responses to the issues that were raised at the November 2nd MAC uh, public workshop. And I'll just briefly go over the major ones. Uh, Linda Creek, a uh, lot of concern that the maps were showing Linda Creek as perennial, where residents say it's not the case that just a few weeks ago it was bone dry and it is indeed intermittent. And our response is basically we have to follow the USGS maps, and USGS shows that as perennial. Um, we made notes in the, the text that that may not be the case, or we know it's not the case because we see that it is dry. Douglas Boulevard and Eureka Road Risks in the circulation chapter, ultimate right away that we're acquiring now is uh, six lanes on Douglas and four lanes on Eureka. It's um, what we're conditioning projects as, we're obtaining that right away as the projects, projects come in. There was a lot of concern that does that uh, basically put in stone that Douglas eventually will be six lanes in, in Eureka four Basically, there would be 10 lanes east-west in Granite Bay, and there's a lot of concern that they didn't want this. And the response is, we're getting the right of way today. Most likely, the need isn't there, obviously, today, tomorrow, or sometime in the future, but it's just to preserve something that may be necessary 40, 50 years, years from now. 
uh, questions are raised about the baseline data and the circulation elements from 2005. Some of the information they relayed on, or relied on when that was updated uh, was five years old then. We realize it's, it's out of date now. The MAC actually uh, wanted us to add further notation just to, to recognize in the document that this information is inaccurate. It's, uh, it could be updated. We're limited in doing that updating because a lot of the recommendations in the circulation chapter were based on that information. So if you updated that, it would filter down and it may change the recommendations, which would send us into an EIR, which we're trying to avoid. The bikeway and trail implementation, a lot of questions about uh, segments. Um, get a, pr uh, a really comprehensive trails plan in the document and questions about when do these, how do we implement this as a community? And the answer was basically as projects come forward, they're gonna be conditioned. Also, um, as money's available from the county to fill in those missing pieces. Uh, questions were raised about the wetlands, uh, the maps in the, the initial document, it was hard to see where the wetlands were, so we created a new wetlands map, which is in the latest version. And then subdivision gates are our biggest issue. Uh, questions raised about pedestrian access into to gated subdivisions, and the language in your document says it shall be non-restricted. And questions raised about material land, lighting, landscaping, and lawns in the design of subdivision gates. And the policies read it should be natural and not um, uh, a more formal landscaping. And then where standards apply and questions about where these new guidelines would be in effect when gates are, are put into Granite Bay and the, the short answer is it's where a private gated road connects to a public road. So it can be uh, basically four lots and more or even it can be three lots if it's got that um, connection to the public road. So last night, uh, the, the back voted four to one to recommend adoption of the Granite Bay Community Plan. And just the caveat that they asked that staff footnote those tables and we'll, we'll be doing that before we go to the Board of Supervisors. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so, so this project uh, plan update, it is subject to CEQA. Uh, we did prepare an environmental document for this project. Uh, that was a, a straight negative declaration. Uh, that negative declaration was circulated for the required 30-day public review. Uh, that period closed December 6th, just a couple days ago. Uh, we got only received one comment letter. It was from the Regional Water Quality Control Board. Uh, and it was just a, the standard uh, kind of boilerplate letter that they send out on, on, on all projects. So today's workshop, uh, this is a platform where staff is available to answer questions. Uh, we want to hear from your commission, hear from the folks in the audience. Uh, as uh, the chairman indicated before, uh, the planning commission is not being asked to take any action today. Uh, depending on the outcome of today's workshop, uh, we would like to come back in January. There is a meeting on January 12th uh, so that you could possibly take a uh, or make a recommendation on the plan that we can forward to the Board of Supervisors. Uh, and just for anybody who is in attendance, our contact information is up there. Uh, so with that, I'll uh, bring it back up to the Commission and uh, staff will be available upon questioning. Okay, well, does, it, does the commission have any initial questions? Okay, uh, seeing none, then we'll go ahead and let the uh, public make comments, and then we'll bring it back to the commission and see if we have any more questions. So uh, at this time, uh, members of the public, if you would like to step forward to the microphone, you're welcome to do that. Uh, make sure that you uh, clearly spell out your name. Are they going to record their names today? or? On a piece of paper? Okay. Okay. Okay, so the microphone's open, folks. Hello, my name is Jane Negri, and I live at 4502 Olive Ranch Road in Granite Bay. And I'll read this because it always makes me nervous to come up here. I was a member of the original committee 
that developed the first Granite Bay Community Plan, one of our main goals at that time was to protect the unique rural character of our Granite Bay area. Now over 20 years later, I served on the MAC subcommittee to revise the goals and policies of our community plan. And one of our main purposes remains to protect the unique rural character of Granite Bay. All of the work of the subcommittee was based on the surveys taken in 2009. Everyone had an opportunity to participate in this activity. So if changes were needed, that was the time to speak up. We found that the majority of the community supported our community plan and they wanted it to remain the same. People liked the already established goals and policies. Then came the real work of the subcommittee to update and clarify our goals and policies. It is important that you realize that none of these issues were taken lightly. We spent 17 months in in-depth discussions on each one. We discussed each pro and con many times. And often we didn't agree, but we had to compromise and move on. The county staff worked diligently to write and rewrite each section. They provided us with many experts to help us understand what was required in our updated plan. The most difficult policy was in regard to the gates. Our current community plan has language in it to limit gates, and the community supports this idea as seen by their support of the existing plan. However, every time a gate issue comes before the Planning Commission or the Board of Supervisors, they in decide in favor of the developer and not the community. We were told that we needed more specific language about when gates should be allowed. The resulting policy in the revised plan is a compromise. Neither side won, but is what the majority of the sub committee agreed to support. Some people wanted more gates, some people wanted no gates. There, were, there are provisions for gates, and we also included public access as part of our compromise. We are aware that our planning commissioner and our supervisors support gates, but this is not just their plan. It is the plan of the entire Granite Bay community, and it was developed by the people of Granite Bay. So we would ask as you go through and look at the changes that you would support a revised community plan. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next person. My name is Madeline Kalaney and I live at 7495 Red Bed Road in Granite Bay and that's to the east of Auburn Folsom along the Douglas Corridor. I too would like to speak regarding gates, and I know it's a contentious issue. And I understand there are situations, or maybe it's not appropriate for someone to walk through a gated community, but there are situations, and even with Los Lagos, if they have a horse trail or if they're attached to Boulder Road like they are, maybe the people in Walden Woods would like to walk through there, and I'll get to that later. Winterhawk is an example that went in, and on the, the north of it is... Gibson, and on the south is Olive Ranch and Berg. And it's, if you wanted to walk from, get from Gibson to Olive Ranch, you would have to go all the way down to Barton, come around, go down Olive Ranch in order to get to Berg itself. So there really is no walking area unless you can walk through the, the development, which is on the eastern side. Uh, I, I don't think anyone wants to go in there and rob them. I they have had robberies because they left the, the gate open and the garage doors open. And I know a friend's Porsche was stolen, so... That was their responsibility. There's also a situation where maybe you have, as they were talking about, communities that attach to larger roads, and that doesn't make sense to have gates, and I understand that with, with Douglas Ranch. Also, retirement communities might be brought up, and Escaton does not have gates, but it's a self-contained community, and there's one that's being discussed on the corner of Fuller and Auburn Folsom, and I don't know if there's a necessity for gates or not. I don't know because right across the street is a nice little shopping area where you can go. You can get a donut or get your hair cut or go over and have Chinese food. So it's an issue that really needs to be thought through. Now, I live in Lake Ridge. 
and I walk about four days a week. And fortunately, there's no gates, and I can walk in Lakewood, uh, Lakeland, Folsom Terrace, and Hidden Lakes. And I have friends in all those developments, and I can stop in and see Tony Rosello, or I can stop and see Lynn Perkins, or Martha Losh, and these are all the different developments. And it gives me a chance to use a different trail, or I can even go down to the lake. And, I, and one time I was, I was walking, and I, I, there was a family, they had come all the way from the other side of of, CR, of uh, I'll get it yet, Armand Folsom. And they were able to come across Fuller, walk through my hotel, and then go down to the lake. And they wouldn't have been able to do that if there were lakes. Douglas, uh, you can walk upon, but they haven't finished the walkway uh, all the way up to Armand Folsom. They finished it to, well, it goes to Lake Wood. Then you have to walk along the road until you get down toward CVS and uh, the bank. Uh, I had, the other day, in fact, I did walk to the bank. I, I walked to the post office and CVS. So I understand why some people want gates, but in my situation where I live out toward the end and toward uh, the Granite Bay area, it's great not to have them. I walk through all these developments just to vary my, my walking as I walk three or four days a week, and my husband takes the dog for a walk and gives him variety also. So I haven't found any problems not having gates, so I hope you consider that in your deliberation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next. Are we at the end point with uh, public comments? Good afternoon, County Board of Supervisors. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. My name is uh, Tony Cardoso. Uh, I have a real estate company in Granite Bay, Capital Pacific Company, and we also live in Granite Bay. Uh, we've attended very many, quite a few uh, Granite Bay MAC meetings, and uh, the initial meeting uh, where there was talk of uh, redoing this community plan. And as you probably know, it was uh, the response of changing the community plan was, uh, wasn't uh, very receptive. In fact, uh, and not to bring up anything negative, but uh, I think they want to impeach Kurt Euler and whatever. It was a pretty tough go. It appears now, uh, and again, I appreciate all the work that uh, the subcommittee has done for this revision. It looks like uh, one of the things that they've dropped, of course, is the land use uh, possibilities of changing that. I think it was an easier thing to do just to forget that part and let's focus on the, this new plan. Uh, being a, a business owner and uh, a developer, big developer, right? Uh, we have uh, five acres right there in Granite Bay where uh, Lakeside Beverage, you know, that property's only been there for, you know, 60 years. We'd like to eventually develop that, which I think we subsequently got a, approval on that. I think the plan now, it appears that the, the community is advocating a slow growth, which you know, that might be a good idea. It, it appears that they're putting more and more restrictions on, on trying to get some good, good growth. And I think that's what Granite Bay needs is uh, maybe something that's not necessarily pushed down your, your throat or something we don't want. But I think with some good smart planning and, and good structures, uh, I think we can continue to make in Granite Bay uh, a good place to live. Uh, a little comment on the gate, gated type situations. Uh, well, we also have 20 acres right there on Auburn Folsom Road that we, we eventually like to develop into a senior development. And I think that's a, a good application for a gate. Uh, I guess it's still <clears throat> viable or possibility it appears that there's added restrictions if indeed you're going to put a gate. Uh, and one of the p 
provisions, as I understand it, if you're going to have a gate, you're going to have to have uh, a walking, uh, a man gate, or a person, a person could come in and out, uh, unrestricted. Uh, I thought that was a little unusual, uh, more specifically on the gate possibilities. As a property owner, uh, I haven't checked completely all the restrictions and the rules and regulations on the, the Granite Bay uh, provisions for uh, lighting, for commercial, for uh, business people. Uh, I think it's important for business people to uh, succeed the best they can in this economic uh, environment that we have and try not to put additional restraints on, on try to succeed in business. And a lot of them are, are struggling, as we know. And uh, I think we got to support them. So I uh, appreciate the County Board of Supervisors maybe taking a look at uh, what the community is asking. Uh, and understand that we got to all work together and uh, make Granite Bay a good place to live and succeed in business. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Next person. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Members of the Commission, Dave Cook, 313 Wingfoot, Granite Bay. That is a gated community, one of a few that I have been accused of uh, developing in Granite Bay. Um, I'll echo what Jane and Madeline said. This is a great process. I participated in these workshops, uh, the, the subcommittee, not all 17 meetings, but most of them. And um, lucky to get out with uh, my, uh, I guess, without too many piercings or too many. Uh, axes in the back. I think we, we got along pretty well. Uh, I'd say, aside from staff, at least half this audience behind me participated in that, uh, in that process. And it was really, um, it was a great process to be involved with and a great one to, uh, to watch. Gates were the most contentious issue, without a doubt. Um, there are different philosophies. I think many of you know, because I've been here before with uh, projects that include gates, that's something that, as a developer, I feel it, it is warranted and it is desired by a lot of the market. Um, I think the policies that we came up with were actually very good, and I've only got concern, I think, with the, the final issue of pedestrian access. I think the other conditions made a lot of sense. I question whether unrestricted pedestrian access raises liability and potential legal issues for uh, an HOA or for the property owners within. Uh, the fire department requires a man gate on any gated neighborhood for purposes of uh, safety response uh, so they can get a crew through there by foot if not uh, being able to get the engine in right away. Um, this was a process of compromise and you get to a point where to get on to the next issue it's time to understand that those who are participating in the process and everybody was welcome but not everybody was there there's a time to say you know what this is close enough and, and let's move this thing along. And I think the MAC did the right thing last night in endorsing the approval of this. But I suggest that this body take a closer look at pedestrian access because if there is not a restriction on daylight hours, for instance, I think there may be some potential problems. And I, I think that clarification or prioritization where you might provide through access or access when there is connectivity to an adjacent neighborhood or to some other amenity, such as a trail system, but when it's a, a dead end and there's no trail that takes you back out of the neighborhood, I'm not sure that it's as important. But regardless, I, I think that the other design elements, the other prioritization and criteria that were placed are probably a good idea for what's left in Granite Bay to be built out. Um, I, I think the only other thing that, that I would raise separate from Gates, and it, it only came up, or at least I recall it as an issue uh, when this was presented to the MAC in its semi-finished form for the first time, 
um, last month, and that's what Tony was alluding to, and that's the lighting and signage for business. And we didn't spend a lot of time on that in the subcommittee, but there's a fine and delicate balance in maintaining the rural character of a community and allowing businesses to succeed and thrive. And uh, one of my favorite examples is in Tree Lake Village. And I didn't come to any of the hearings, but I re remember some of the early neighborhood meetings. Great design concept, put the buildings in front, put the parking lot in back, let's not have any signage. Well, that center, for reasons in addition to that, because there's simply not enough uh, traffic and uh, head count or, or rooftop count there, but that center has really struggled. And so we don't have a lot of signage there. They added some signs, and I know there was an outcry, but what we have are some very irritating lights that wrap the columns, other things that those business folks have had to do to call attention to their particular businesses, because otherwise, we drive by, we're creatures of habit, and if we can't tell what's in there, whether it's open, it makes it difficult. Again, that's not something that the subcommittee spent a lot of time on, and I'm not sure that it's something that the commission needs to spend a lot of time on, but I think it's worth some consideration. There may be a better way to balance these goals of maintaining a rural character as well as allowing a business to, uh, to succeed. Thank you very much. Before you sit down, if I may. Yeah. A couple things. Dave, first, with, with respect to the latter point on, on lights and signage and whatnot, uh, from what I read in the, in the plan, the proposal was to just let the countywide ordinance uh, prevail in this situation. And you may recall that not too many months ago, maybe it was a year ago, we had a case with the quarry ponds, I think is the name, where they came in and they wanted to put in Gee, I think eight or 12 business names where only three were allowed or something to that effect. Are you saying that the business conditions in Granite Bay are such that we should create an exception and consider that here as a, as a policy board? Or are you saying that the county as a whole should reconsider the policies and the county ordinance? Well, I would say that the county should start by looking at what are those 1997 standards? The, uh, the current uh, zoning ordinance, uh, when it was uh, updated, was 1994, I believe. It, it may be time, but between that and the county's rural design guidelines, it may be time to look at those because I understand the position that puts this body in when one asks for exceptions. And I don't know that we can blame the demise of Quarry Pond on a limitation to only three names on the sign. No, I only pointed it out because but, we had to deal with it on a one-off basis. Right, yeah. right. There aren't that many shopping centers in, in Granite Bay, but I think it might be worthwhile if there's time and there, the resources are available to, to take another look at those um, policies, and then perhaps that's an update to the community plan at some other point once the county has got their arms around it. Or maybe it's better to recommend the staff maybe consider it some time considering those ordinances as a general application right. throughout the county and not interfere with the progress of this particular plan. And, and I don't know that the restrictions are that onerous, but, but I know we, we tightened it down a, a little bit and business owners like Tony weren't there. And by the way, he didn't announce it, but he is the new owner of Quarry Pond. No. And I'm sure he'd like to have the opportunity to do some things to make sure that succeeds the second time around. Yeah. We run into this in other places in the county as well, and I'm thinking of the Burger King up at Nyack where they wanted to put up a huge pole and a sign and whatnot, but we applied the county ordinances. That was several years ago. And uh, you know maybe it is time to take another look at the, the business signs. What we don't want is like Los Angeles where you go down Wilshire Boulevard and it's just constant signs and you can hardly tell one fluorescent neon light from the next. Exactly. Yeah. And I think there was some work done on the, the Douglas Corridor um, component some time back that, that uh, as part of the circulation element. I don't know how many of those pieces, because I'd, frankly I wasn't that plugged into the process and I didn't pay that much attention. I don't know how much of that got plugged into the, the, the signage. And again, I don't, I don't think it's a major issue and I don't think the gates are a major issue. I just think it's worth taking a little closer look and f from a, a more technical and perhaps a more legal standpoint to make sure that we haven't created a document that really isn't that enforceable. 
I'm sure that you will see many more developments come in that will propose gates and hopefully the language in that community plan will filter those out to where not every one of them gets a gate because they can't meet the criteria. And that was one of the reasons that I, I cooperated and participated in that process as opposed to uh, continually protesting. But I do think unrestricted pedestrian access does need some potential refinement. Yeah, I brought up the lights because uh, I know you are very active in, in that area and uh, have a lot of experience. And I really want to know, is this something that we should look at you know, immediately with respect to this plan? Or is it something that's generic for the whole county and we should let this plan go forward? And from what I see in the plan itself, where it just incorporates by reference the county standards, it's, I think it may be the latter. Go ahead and let this progress because you guys just spend an awful lot of time on it and take another look at the standards at some time in the future that will apply to county. -wide. I agree with, with that. I think that's more practical enough. I think that also that's probably the, the type of respect to show those who participated in the process at this point to make wholesale changes or to send it back for refinements that aren't necessary right now would not be the, the right sign. But again, and no pun intended, with, uh, with that, but uh, again, my only concern has to do with the use of the term unrestricted pedestrian access. Yeah, and my comment there is, you know, given <clears throat> your lead in that this was a long, hard fought process with 17 meetings, and I know people have spent a lot of time on this, is, and, and what you're objecting to was in effect one of those points of compromise. Is this now the time to go back and pick at that specific one, or should we accept the compromise as a package? I know that there are probably a half dozen people behind me who have got a very easy answer to that. Um, I'm not sure that I want to weigh in. I think I've made my position okay. fairly clear, and that's something that you've got to support. It's, it was the subcommittee, and it was a process of democracy. It doesn't necessarily reflect what the community wants, but it does reflect what those who elected to participate and it, wanted and to have. may in fact represent what the community wants. We don't it, know either way, do we? It, it, we don't. I know that there's one aspect that doesn't reflect what I want. I, I can live with it if this document were to go forward as written, but it's something that, again, I, I ask the commission to, to consider. Well, I'm hesitant as one individual to recommend to my fellow commissioners that we go back and rip open that package, given that it was so long developed. <laughs> I would just rather accept it as a, you know, for lack of a better word, up or down vote as a, as a group. But and I'm willing to listen. And I understand and, and would respect and We will have a chance to vote on it. No, oh, this isn't a vote today. I understand <laughs> that. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm looking for the next person. Are we done? Oh, I figured. This, is this, is this shyness to date or what? No. <laughs> Sandy Harris, 5911 Reba Drive. No, because I think the people in front of me have said pretty much what we all felt. It was a good committee. We put a lot of time into it. We had a lot of discussion on it. We ended up friends. I, it's one of the best committees I've ever worked on. I think staff did a great job guiding us through all this. And Kathy, she came to the meetings. And somebody brought cookies to all the meetings, and that was appreciated. But um, yeah, I would be a little bit cautious about lighting because almost every one of the um, businesses is located in a residential area. And this is truly a residential community. And so too much lighting could create problems with the homes around it. And um, uh, as far as the gate issue, um, unlimited uh, walkthrough, maybe they want to put a little lock on it, they can lock it at night, but I still think they should have pedestrian access in the daytime because in the area where I live in Granite Bay, we don't have trails and I have to walk through a gated community to get off some of the little narrow roads that don't have any um, walk space and they drop off into ditches. So that's one way of staying off some of the more dangerous streets. But basically the plan, um, you know, we didn't agree on everything, but we're ready to move forward with it. Thank you. Sandy, okay. before you sit down, did you have anything to do with the trails? Not much because we did that in the circulation element many years ago, and I really didn't get too involved with it okay, I'll ask in my you. mind. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. 
okay, and I'm looking at an audience that's looking back at me, and I'm getting ready to, okay. I'm pretty shy, so you're going to have to bear with me. My name is Sue Cardoso. It's okay. We, we can deal with this. And uh, I do live in Granite Bay in a gated community. And uh, we have, well, I don't know if it's the oldest shopping center, but next to the oldest. And now we have the newest shopping center in Granite Bay. So, uh, you know, I'm concerned about our tenants uh, making it. We've had to cut the rents in half, and uh, we're working with them. Okay. And uh, as far as the gated community, um, we do have 20 acres, like my husband says, on uh, Auburn Folsom Road. And uh, we would like, my dream is to one day have a senior house in there. And we've, we've already said that we would donate a trail by the, by the tr creek back there. And um, to build this, we would like, I mean, we have the land, but we don't have the money. So my dream someday is to get someone to build it and have a, have a, um, a, a good senior housing with commercial in front where you could have a travel agency and, and you know, uh, get your hair done, your nails done, and all that stuff in a nice restaurant maybe. and, and you know, to, to uh, dress up Granite Bay and have a nice little community there and people could walk. But I don't agree that they should walk through the senior housing in the daytime or nighttime because I'm getting older and if I want to go there and live there, I, I would want the privacy. I wouldn't want the, the school kids coming through there and, and you know, causing problems. So that that's just my dream so thank you okay thank you okay is there going to be a next okay uh not seeing anybody that looks like they're getting ready to stand up then i uh, will just kind of close the public part and then uh, bring it to the uh, commission if there's more questions or comments I just, I just have one comment. Um, I noticed that the MAC meeting last night, uh, our staff was uh, four to one. It was the person that was voted no on it was the major issue, the Gates, or is, was there another issue? The Gates was the issue. The Gates was the issue. Yes. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Jeffrey? And then? EJ, define rural for me, please. Not urban. Not urban. Define rural. Did we define rural in the community plan in the beginning? I don't believe we have a, a definition. The, the rural was was used through throughout the process, and and I think if you talk to different members of the community, you may have a definition of of rural. We might have five different. <laughs> um, I guess my my question or comment regarding that is is that according to the numbers you presented this morning. Um, in the last 25 years, basically, the uh, population of Granite Bay has about doubled, uh, plus about 10,000 people anyway. And my, my mental picture of this is that those new parcels created, the new subdivisions created, the, the majority of the new people coming into Granite Bay are not moving into a a rural area um, by by my definition anyway by what I I picture as rural um, my my guess is is that a majority of the new lots that have gone in in the last 25 years are one acre or less and I'm just I'm wanting to get a feel for I mean this it's it's followed in here that that we are attracted by the rural environment that it is an attractive rural character, and it's, it's used many times in here, beginning in the assumptions, and then carried all the way through. And so, 
Yeah, if, I, if I'm going to provide any answer to that, I'd, I'd rely on the land use map that's in front of you right now. And uh, if you look at the map, you know, many of you know where the, the development has occurred over uh, the last 20 years. This is uh, Douglas Boulevard to here. Much of the development, uh, the Tree Lake area, which is, which uh, I'm not sure you would consider rural, I, I rural, wouldn't. more, more, I mean, more, more of a definition. suburban type development. Uh, the areas at the other end of the spectrum, you have the rural estate designated areas up uh, north and south of Cabot Stallman Road and rural rural residential. You have you know much larger acreages. I think you know clearly these areas up in here uh, are, are and down around the Eureka Road north and south. Those areas uh, are rural. They are the larger lots. Uh, so, so you have a you know over the last 20 years or so, uh, you know things have uh, significantly changed. Uh, so you know Granite Bay contains both rural and suburban areas. It is, it, to, to me, what's attracted the new people coming in aren't coming into rural. Maybe um, they're coming in for both. Possibly, I just I, I just when we get into the the premise, if that's wrong, it's carried through the rest of the plan, and so. I guess I just, you know, have a concern about that. Okay, Jerry? <clears throat> EJ, I wanted to ask you about trails. And uh, for purposes of this discussion, you can turn to page 140 of your hymnal, and there are some pictures there of the various classes of bike trails. And when you look at the proposed trails on the map, the locations are good. My question has to do with the class type. Given that this is kind of an objective document and something that we would like to see the community grow out to in the future, and given that most people would prefer a class one bike path, which is physically separated from the road rather than having to walk alongside traffic, why wouldn't we have class one bikes bike trails everywhere. And then if we can't make, afford them, we'll put in a class two or something else. Uh, my concern is this will become a limitation. If we have the money to put in a class one bike trail someplace and we look at this path and say, no, 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 it's only a class three, so we can't put in a class one, it will become a limiting factor. Why wouldn't we go for the gusto on all of them and then uh, use economics to limit it if we had to? And, and, and that's where it probably comes down to, economics and, and, and how do you, Pay for the trails. We show them on the map, and uh, you know, we typically get get those easements through developments or get them constructed through development. But without that, uh, you know, they are lines on the map. Uh, I am going to rely on uh, our our experts, other staff experts. We have uh, Andy Fisher with Parks Department, and maybe I'll maybe I'll first, Andy, if you would uh, just talk about the map. Y'all have a copy of the plan in front of you. Uh, I'll have. Uh, Andy, talk about what, what the lines mean, the dashed lines mean, just so you have a clear understanding of what is shown on the map. Uh, and then Andrew Gaber with Public Works, uh, uh, he can get in more about the, uh, you know, the bike lanes and so forth and how they interact with the, the roadways and also the lines on the map. And then maybe he could answer my question after all that. <laughs> I, let me, I'd just like to chime in on there. Uh, the subcommittee talked about the classes of trails and there was a lot of recognition that some of these rural roads were very unsafe for bicyclists in Granite Bay and a lot of the bicyclists are coming from throughout the region to utilize uh, Folsom Lake and head up towards the hills where it's a little bit more challenging. And ideally class one was preferred, however, once you get to class one, you also change the character of those roads. And there was a give and take. Do we want the class one trails or do we want to preserve the rural character of some of those roads such as Eureka and Barton? Okay, so let's follow that through for just a second. Let's say that we have one of those roads that has the two foot drop off immediately to the side of the pavement and be very difficult as a practical matter to put in a class one bike trail. So perhaps on this plan, you show that as a class three because we can make the pavement just a little bit wider and give a place for a bicycle. Would we be prohibited from putting in a class three bicycle trail or in the future 
class three if we had it shown as a class one on this map? That's a good question. Is that a legal question? Yeah, no, actually, uh, Jerry, no, I don't think you would. I think the issue here, and maybe Chris touched on it, maybe uh, Andy will, is, is your design criteria upon approval of development. So um, you, could, you could require a class one, and if you had the money, you'd put in a class three. Um, so you wouldn't be precluded from doing that. Okay, but now then you'd the be designing it to a class one from the, from, from the initial approval. Now turn the question upside down. It's showing a class three, and we wanted to put in a class one because we have money that came from heaven somewhere, and, and we want to put in this class one bypass. Would we now be prohibited from this, by this plan from going with that, or would we have to do a supplemental EIR, or would it be a bunch of jumping through hoops that we otherwise wouldn't have to do if it was already specified class one. You would have to do a little bit more analysis if you were to upgrade it. And again, if it were to change the design characteristic upon which you're installing the trail. So in yeah. other words, a class one requires wider right of way and things like that. And if you didn't have that because you only had a class three designated, you'd have to go through and evaluate the difference to upgrade it to the class one. Yeah, so the, the underlying question is, would it hurt us to go ahead and specify all as the design criteria of class one and then just let economics determine uh, what we actually build. I don't know if it would hurt you, that'd be a planning issue, but again, then you'd be setting your approval design criteria for a class one instead of a class three in all of those designations. Yeah. So when somebody comes in for approval, you'd be looking at class one trail to condition the project instead of a class three. Yeah, would that be bad? Well, that, that, that's the policy call. Yeah. I don't know. So, Jerry, then would something not get built if money was there to put it in as a class three, but because it was shown as a class one, we're waiting for the money to do it the way it is on the Well, board. that was the question I and had. Something would it, doesn't get yeah. built. Can we go ahead and build the class three under your scenario uh, because that's all the money we have, even though we would like in, in finality to have a class one there? Does it somehow limit us as a matter of law? from uh, building a class three when it specifies class one. I, economics is another matter. Sorry. Good afternoon, Commission. Andy Fisher, Placer County Parks and Grounds Division. I'll try to um, add to that a little bit if I can. Um, directly to Commissioner Brentnall's question, can we build a class one trail if we have shown a uh, multi-use or a class three trail? The answer is yes, we can and we have. Uh, one example would be from uh, along Barton Road going from Roseville Parkway to the south. Uh, we actually had a donor come to us offering to, uh, to pay for that trail, and so what was previously designated as a multi-use um, natural surface trail became a paved trail, so we can always upgrade when that's available. Um, in, uh, in terms of environmental review, uh, we always uh, we, we look at the, the community plan as a programmatic document for trails, and any project that the county would undertake to physically construct a trail uh, always goes through a further environmental review at the project level. So whatever the impacts are of the trail we wind up building, that's what we, what we analyze at the time of the project. Uh, so hopefully that, that answers that a little bit. Uh, I also wanted to talk uh, about how we put this trail plan together. Uh, we didn't start from scratch. We took, and in, in, in this is, uh, I'm going to chime in on the behalf of my counterpart, Andrew Gaber, here in Public Works a little bit, but we took the existing bikeway plan from the, Plas from the adopted Placer County uh, Transportation Planning Commission and uh, brought that into this document. We also took the existing trail plan uh, that we had from the existing Placer County uh, or the existing Granite Bay Community Plan dropped it in. The intent was, was to not start from scratch, to, to take our existing and our baseline with very few changes. From there, we updated uh, to show what we actually have acquired since the adoption of these previous plans. So you, you'll see on here, uh, I don't know if we have a copy of the trail plan available, but if you see it within the document, within the legend we differentiate between what uh, has been acquired and what is planned. And part of our implementation will be to keep that up as we acquire more so that that document keeps, uh, keeps being updated as, as we do acquire more of the segments that we show in here. Uh, the only trails that have been added, I believe, and Andrew can, can check me if I'm wrong or, or Chris can, uh, we did bring in two trail segments off that were recommended by the Dry Creek Greenway Plan, and that, those segments 
were along, Chris, I believe, Strap Ravine, and what was the other one? Strap Ravine between Douglas and the Roseville city limits, and it's Linda Creek through... The Linda uh, Creek through Tree Lake. Through Tree Lake. So those should be the only two additions to this plan, unless there's further changes. Did the uh, class of the bicycle trail along Auburn Folsom remain the same? That I'm going to have to defer to Andrew. I just wanted Andrew to come up and talk. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes it did stay the same. It hasn't been changed. It, um, it has not been changed? It has not been changed. Oh, okay. Um, Andrew Gaber, DPW Transportation. The you present an interesting challenge because one of the biggest issues that we would have is, is that to get any funding or to really be able to, and I want to keep that man, um, dualized projects. Right now, we try and our bicycle master plan, which was done in 2002, um, we've just been working with SACOG to make sure that their master plans for bicycle trails throughout the region is consistent. Um, that if we change everything now to a class one, we're going to have this consistency issue and which uh, becomes a problem when you're trying to get funding or what have you, that it's, well, okay, we have that in our community plan that shows one thing, but it's shows in these other documents as something else. And so it becomes a bit of a problem for you if you're trying to get grant funding or something. Um, physically, trying to be able to build it. That's, that's another matter. That I yeah. understand. Yeah. Auburn Folsom Road, I'd love to have a separated trail. It's a very dangerous street, but, you know, Practically, maybe we simply can't do it. If it's going to generate some sort of an issue with funding and, and so forth, then I, I support what's here. I was just saying that now is the chance, and it only comes up once every 20 years, to go back and repaint the barn some different color. And you know, if, if, in fact, class one bike trails were the preferred method, and I think those who ride bicycles, we're going to see more and more of them as, as gasoline gets more expensive. I think they would agree they would rather have a separate separate lane than now's the time to put it in as a, as a goal. But if it's a practical matter going to generate issues, then we'll just leave it the way. Well, in, in interesting uh, point, I've uh, recently come uh, acclimate or familiar with the Sierra Foothills Bicycling Club, which is the, the largest club up in this area. Um, I attended their meeting last month and talked with them. Their preference is not for class one, their preference is for class two trails because these are, the, these are you know, when you hear about these big groups of 20 people out there on a weekend or what have you, they're that type of a bicycle club. They work with that type of groups, they work with those types of, of sizes. And for them, having a class two works much better because then they're able to be on the road, there's adequate pavement for them. Um, a class one doesn't do anything for them because there's too many of them and they don't, they, you know, if they people encounter people that are jogging or walking out there with a stroll or something like that, there's conflict. So they want to be on the road. So you talk to any of your, you know, avid bicyclists, they want to be on the road. They don't want to be on a class one. Yeah, they want so, speed. I don't know if it's speed necessarily, but it, it's, there's the ability to be out there and, and yeah. Okay. I was only asking because, once again, now's the chance to, you know, reach for the brass ring, and I'd hate to see it go by and have to wait another 20 years, and, and then 10 years from now saying, well, if we had only known then that we could have updated this. So, okay, I'll take your word for it, and you okay. convinced me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Eric? maybe maybe while we have the bicycle grooves available, I think I think each community has to decide which type of trail system is well suited for them. Example being at the lake where I'm from, we need multi-use trails because we use them in the wintertime for cross-country skiing and so we don't want them on the edge of the highway at all. We can't live with them there. So if we want multi-use trails, we have to have class one trails. Well, that means that we have to have expensive trails, number one, which is bad but it means we get year-round use out of them and by doing that. So it goes back to the point, I think each community has to scrutinize the system that they're putting in and where it's gonna to go to and from to determine which trail system is the best. And I, and I agree, these clubs, they all, you know, we have that last year, we had that world-class cycling thing at the lake. They didn't even wanna have a class two, they wanted to be right on the highway. So there's just so many different variations that, 
you have to just do segment by segment, I think, and determine which is the most suited for that particular area. Thank you. Okay, any other comments from the commission? You want to talk about gates? If you bring it up. Let's talk about gates. Okay. <laughs> I mean, gates are obviously an issue. They were an issue for the whole committee and the whole group from the MAC trying to put this together, and they're an issue that comes before planning every time somebody wants to put in a new subdivision. Um, I think if it's addressed properly in here, it might put some of that to rest. We tend to, as has been said, approve what's asked for or, or form thereof. Um, if there was some acceptable criteria allowing them in certain instances, I think it would save a a lot of grief all the way around. Um, that being said, um, within the, the draft there is some criteria put out that um, in, in my opinion could, could use some changing. Um, my personal view, when you have a private piece of property that's undeveloped and nobody has access to it except the property owner, because it's developed, I don't know that that necessarily needs to change. Um, it's still private property. The private property owner should have the access to it and should be able to, for liability reasons, privacy reasons, whatever, still restrict access to that. If we are going to consider putting a gate up, uh, a pedestrian gate, and allowing the public unrestricted access to private property as a condition of their development, um, definitely think that the property owner should be able to lock that gate after dark. Um, or something to that extent. Um, like I say, my personal feeling is, is it shouldn't be there at all. If we're going to go with, a, with, a, with an open access, then it should be able to be locked up in, in the evening hours. Um, you know, we have a limit of six feet on the height of perimeter walls. I think in a lot of instances we have backyards backing up to big streets and six feet just probably isn't, isn't high enough in some cases, and uh, that should be looked at. Um, but uh, it, it otherwise, uh, like I say, I think we need to, uh, to take a look at some of this and, and provide for, for an avenue so we're not dealing with this as an uh, appeal point or a, you know, a one at a time with no criteria approval. My turn. Okay. Any other, uh, any, any comments? Yeah, I have line? a comment. Okay. Um, you and I have disagreed on this, I think, since day one, and I think both sides of our arguments have some merit. <clears throat> First of all, the standards for the gate are in our document on page one, 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 three is where I was looking at. I was looking at page 50, gate design. And maybe they're on, they're all over the place. <laughs> And you know, I kind of fall back on the position that this was debated and hammered out and compromised by the community as a whole, and I'm hesitant to wade in and start, for lack of a better word, cherry picking or picking one issue or another. But I disagree with you in philosophy, and, and, and it's this. Normally, I am a big proponent of private property rights, and you should be allowed to do with your property exactly as you say. But you've come to the community, and you want to incorporate an improvement to your property in the fabric of the community and you want to rely on the community to provide services, water, sewer, fire, gas, um, churches, other things that go along and make your subdivision habitable. And for this reason, the community gets to have a say in exactly how it's put together. And one of, the say, one of those issues that they want to raise is accessibility. Uh, I think the studies have pretty well shown that it's a mixed bag, whether, uh, as Robert Frost once said, good fences make good neighbors. Uh, do these gated communities, in fact, divide or bring people together? We can debate that until the end of the day and still not have a consensus. But I believe that there is justification for getting into the issue of gates and the way that it's presented by the committee. I know that those who were anti-gates probably aren't happy with this, and those who are pro-gates, as Dave Cook testified, aren't happy with it either. So in my way of thinking, that makes it a pretty good compromise, and I'm not tempted to open it up. I would just leave it the way it was, and we'll have, what, it, what it means, Jeff, is in the future when one of these comes before us, we'll be debating this very same issue on whether the gates apply to this instant that's on the table. I don't have any problem with the compromise that they struck. 
Well, again, like I say, we do disagree on that. I, I think unrestricted pedestrian, pedestrian access into private property is an over, is an over request in, in, in exchange. I mean, if, if they're asking for, um, you know, for a subdivision map and they're within all the other entitlements, having to open up the property to, to the entire, to entire public is, um, extracting more than they're entitled to. Yeah. I absolutely agree with you, and I think that uh, what they should do is build a wall around all sides of the private property and allow nobody to leave. But as soon as they want to come out and enjoy the community uh, benefits, such as roads, schools, churches, water, well, then we've got a case where I think public should have well, access. Your difference there is, and I know there was a little jest there, but when you're leaving, you're going on to public property. Right. When you're putting your fence up, it's private. Yeah, but you're looking to take advantage of them in your in your private <laughs> method. So, okay. well, I think uh, I think this is going to be a discussion that we have on June 12th, well, July 12th, and you don't want to continue, do January 12th. You don't want to continue today, do you? No, unfortunately, I don't want to. <laughs> well, not to the chair. I, I, I think we've heard both sides. And are there any other comments for anybody? Let me say, I would like to say, uh, you know, since this is a workshop, if somebody has thought of something. If they wish to say in the audience, you're welcome to step forward again. I live on private roads. We have 73 lots in there. They're 2.3 to 4.6 acre zoning. We have two bridges we maintain, and we don't want gates. Um, and I think Jeff is wrong on this private property thing. When a parcel comes in for development, they have conditions on their project, and they have a lot of conditions, the height of the building, how close they can build to a road. Even though it's private and they're developing it, there are still conditions put on it that are supported by the public. And I like people walking through my development. Now, I know staff put together a map showing gated communities over there, but they don't have on there how many private roads we have in Granite Bay. I was trying to think almost I'll bet you 70% of them are private. And if everybody decided to gate them, the title of our plan is Granite Bay Community Plan. And that doesn't make for a community when you start gating off everything. Um, I think most of the roads coming off Eureka, Cabot Stallman, uh, a lot of them on Barton are private roads. And they're not gated. And I don't know why people object to somebody walking through their development. We have people walking through our place all the time. I don't like it if they ride motorcycles through there. But um, I don't know why people are so opposed to not having gates. Anyway, on this trail map, I noticed that they have Douglas Boulevard going north-south, where Auburn Folsom Boulevard should be. Mm -hmm. Sandy, were you on the committee that debated the gates yes and it was we had at least Did it take three, about five minutes we had at least two meetings that that's all we talked about for three hours probably uh, I was also on the original committee for the 1989 community plan and uh, we didn't want gates then and Jeff's part statement about rural of course there are more people living in the higher density because there are more houses but the rural areas are developed even though People coming, you're saying more people coming in now are going to the uh, more dense areas, but there are just as many have moved into the lower density, but because it's lower density, the population's lower. So that doesn't make sense what you were saying. Sandy, these issues that Jeff and I were discussing, is it fair to say that those were debated extensively by we your We debated everything. And so what's presented before us today is the compromise that a compromise. both sides lived And with. we had a lot of homework because a lot of times when we would disagree on something, staff would put it, they would put it out to us on emails and we would come through and put our input on it and then get back to the next meeting and debate it all over. So we really did put a lot of work into this. So we'd like to see it go forward. Okay, thank you, Sandy. Anybody else want to uh, put a footnote on anything? Mr. Chairman, I would just like to make sure that the people that, when it does come to us for our final decision, that they have, if they really have a heartburn with any item on there, that they send an email to staff or get the information to them so we can get the information to us 
along with our agenda package the week before our meeting. I mean, mm -hmm. they can come on the day of the meeting too, but if they give it to us in writing, that would be that would be nice. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Well, as I understand, uh, we're at least tentatively on the docket for January 12th. And at that meeting, we'll have to resolve these issues with some finality. So appreciate all you coming to uh, talk to us today and listen. And so hopefully we'll see you on January 12th. With that, I'll close the meeting.